Uh, okay, so this is a, uh, yeah. Okay, part two of our new series on truth makers. Uh, I am calling in from the dark this particular week. No explanation is forthcoming, but hopefully it'll be fixed next week. <laughs> uh, oh. And yet, I say, what did we read? We read David Armstrong's A General Theory, uh, The General Theory of Truth Making. I think A General Theory might have been a better title. But anyway, uh, I, I read this uh, with such pleasure, not only in the style, but uh, well, the theory itself, I mean, I'll have to admit. I mean, I'll, I'll go further. I'll say, I, I need to buy another Apple device because I have a habit of naming them after uh, philosophers and now I have an extra name and I need another device to name Armstrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about this. Um, the, the sticky issues were all pushed off to later essays, although uh, I believe I didn't look at the table of contents, but he was seemingly suggesting that there are later chapters in the very same book. And I very much look forward to reading those. Uh, but as far as he did go, I have not only nothing to complain about, but also learned a few things that uh, I would not have dreamt of in quite the same way. Uh, and um, looking forward to talking about it uh, and hearing how all of you feel about it. Uh, Kenny, what did you think? Um, I, uh, I enjoy as well. I, um, I've only read, I think, uh, two or three things by Armstrong, but everything I've read, uh, I've really liked. In, including this um, as well. So, um, and uh, it felt like a breath of, of fresh air and, uh, <laughs> after last week's was a little bit uh, rough. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I just, the way he, he laid out the uh, suscitationism and uh, maximalism and I mean, everything about, uh, you know, propositions and, and course, you know, stuff about correspondence later. I mean, it was all, it was a, a general, <laughs> it was a general theory, so, um, which I really felt like I was wanting something more general after last time, after like being in the weeds about a very specific um, ontology, you know, of the moments and everything. Um, and uh, I felt like this was a good counterpart uh, to what we read last time. Cool. And uh, you might want to play with your microphone a bit, or maybe stop playing with it. I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, Josh, what would you think? Oh, OK. Are you, sure. Are you persuaded? Um, I'm, yeah, this is, this is my favorite kind of philosophy. Uh, yes, both because exactly. Like, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I love that. I, I love metaphysics, but this style of philosophy I love. Uh. So, so just mm, so readable. Um, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, um, yeah, there's a lot of things I like about this. This is the first kind of general theory of propositions that that um, is very close to my own. Um, so I was I was really, really pleased by that. Um, Had you read Armstrong much before? Yeah, I read I read two other papers. I'm not sure which one, but I have two others in my, my archives. Um, um, but he, I mean, everything else I read, he cited in. So I'm, I'm more familiar just from citations than from his actual work, probably at this point. Yeah, uh, he always comes He's up. In, of... Yeah, like an SCP always comes up. So I always read like an overview of, you know, Armstrong said something in whatever year, and then I read it and I go on and <laughs> some. Yeah, yeah, just very familiar just in passing. But um, yeah, just a, a really, really fun, fun read. Um, while I agree that it was a nice general overview after the very specific uh, proposal last week about moments, um, I, I did find myself really trying to apply a lot of this general theory and having some issues. And and you know he even says, no, I think this is a, a chapter from his book on truth makers, right? Not not specifically. There's a whole book, yeah. Yeah, it has yeah, a I whole think, book. I think it's right. the first oh. chapter. I mean, it looked like it. I didn't yeah. check, but. I yeah, so you know, modal truths. I was really hoping he would say more in this article, but then you know he doesn't, and and that's something I'm I'm very very curious about, specifically in relation to propositions. So if propositions are intentional objects, um, I I'm trying to figure out what I how I would interpret all this in relation to modal truths. But I'm just wondering what a truth maker would be 
if truth yeah. makers are, if propositions are intentional objects for a modal truth. And I don't think there's enough here for me to even really guess what he would say. So now I really want to read more. But, but that was that was really bugging me. But then I was thinking, okay, well, this actually kind of motivates the the moments philosophy from last week. You know, if, if moments are these sort of slices of of reality, you know, maybe we can go a little bit further with what truth makers would be. Um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. Um, I'm not sure what he would say about that. But yeah, this 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 definitely leaves me with a lot of questions. But it really motivates the question now of what truth makers are. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I felt that, like there was more motivation in this one. Yeah, more motivating yeah. rather. Exactly, yeah, it was good. So, so you have the motivation of of what makes a proposition true, of course, obviously, uh, what makes statements true. But then, what what are the things that make it true? Right? Are are they objects? Are they? Is that going to work for modal truths? Maybe not. So, what what are yeah. they? He kind of attacks. Um, um, well, not necessarily attacks, but David Lewis's account of possibility might not work with this truth maker idea. Um, and I'm wondering. Sure what he has in mind. So yeah, I now I want to read everything he wrote, but um, <laughs> there's a lot to come. Uh, yeah, he's on my list of one of the people to read a lot more of as well at some point. <laughs> we could just Good. follow by reading his whole book, Truth and Truthmakers. Maybe maybe after the yeah. objections, we'll decide whether we still like him or not. Karen, are you, are you going to be, can you please be against him? Otherwise, this is going to be a dumb show. Oh, no, <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm happy to join the Armstrong fan club. And precisely because you don't need a Dakota ring. I mean, he's great. <laughs> he's but I, but I, I do think that like there's, um, you know, the clarity and systematicity with which he put, you know, set out uh, his um, you know, his, his opening points, right? Because this is part of a larger project. Um, you know, it might lead me to underestimate the difficulty of filling in the details, right? Because I do think it's right. going to be very interesting, right? So the, I, I love the, I loved his point that you've got the truth bearer, which he says is a proposition, and you've got the thing that's making that truth, right? The truth, true, the truth maker, which he kind of sort of tentatively defines as a chunk of reality, right? And I like the point that he is, um, that the relationship between a truth bearer and a truth maker isn't going to be a logical relation, right? Isn't going to be entailment, right? Because a truth bearer isn't a proposition, right? Like it's, so it, you know, logical relationships are between propositions and are between truth bearers. And so this is a, what, you know, a relationship of necessitation, right? Now that's interesting. And what does that mean? And cashing that out. Um, and I, and so I like that. And I like, I like the focus on, um, uh, you know, these truth makers as parts of reality. And then of course the details are in how you, you um, account for the, the truths of various um, uh, propositions that don't seem so easy to give a correspondence theory account to, you know, like what is it that uh, claims about fictional entities are corresponding to? What is it that, uh, you know, claims about possibilities and uh, are, are, uh, are um, are corresponding to, um, you know, and so I be, would be interested to hear, to learn, to read more and find out what he says, uh, you know, why he doesn't just become a possible world realist or something to say that, solve that problem. So, which it doesn't seem like he's going to be. Uh, yeah, so I was very interested. I like, I like that he basically argued that maybe truth is a, is a, is a, a prime concept like knowledge, right? That you can't maybe yeah. define it without a remainder. So that was kind of tying into the previous stuff we'd done. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I feel do, like I, this. Yeah, I do. Also, around when Davidson was writing on truth, so yeah, okay. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, and I also think um, uh, that uh, it's interesting that he then defines uh, propositions in terms of the intentional objects of belief and things like that of, of mental states, because you might also think that truth makers are the intentional objects of. I, I need to know more about what it means by intentional object. Um, so yeah, so I'm wondering how the, uh, the 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 process of working out what a proposition is, how separate you can keep that from the account of what a truth maker is, and whether you need to do that. So, yeah, I have some questions, but I was really quite pleased with the article. So, okay, well, it, did yeah, go ahead, Karen. Did you read uh, the combinatorial theory of possibility uh, with us? Oh, my or it was something, I don't remember what the title of the paper was. That's the book actually, but it was something about. Uh, Maybe. 
I'm kind of just curious, but yeah. Because I don't remember when, when that was. But. Yeah. Rules of laws and causation. I'm trying to look at things in my computer that have Armstrong. Oh, that's <laughs> so, all right. yeah. 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 Bird against Armstrong. Is that was that part of it? I'm not sure. Yeah. It was a while ago. Yeah. I have a hard time remembering what we read last week. So. <laughs> right. No, it was. It was, it was I always, ago, I always so. need trigger. You know, I always need some coaxing, and I'm like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Otherwise, I'm just focus on the new. Let's dive in. Let's do it. Well, first yeah. of all, uh, I very much liked that uh, early on he echoes a sentiment I expressed last week, uh, namely that uh, to ask the truth maker question is a promising way to regiment metaphysical inquiry, or to put it in mind language, you can't really do the truth maker question without doing all of metaphysics. <laughs> and, and then he says, but there isn't going to be an easy path here. He's more eloquent, but uh, but he, he does seem to have the same attitude, which is that this is a proxy for all the questions in metaphysics, insofar as if metaphysics speaks to um, what truths, uh, you know, sp specific kinds of truths, the only thing that would make them true are the very objects in question. The very uh, yeah topics and objects maybe not broad enough, but the very things we're talking about, put it that way. Right. Yeah, I thought I thought about that a little bit more, and I was reminded of you uh, when I read that passage, actually. Um, and I mean, it, in some sense, it starts to make sense because, you know, I mean, the truth predicate applies to all true propositions and truth, and you know. If, if the truth makers are all that there is, then uh, sort of how could you not escape the metaphysical questions in general? In general, you know, because any any metaphysical topic, like you're saying, you know, is going to, you know, if it's real, uh, relate to or be, will be a truth maker. It also uh, functions as a, an excuse for keeping the paper relatively short, since. A truly general theory, or I should say a complete theory of truth makers uh, would be a complete metaphysics. So instead, he just handles a few basic cases, makes some general points, and then says, okay, well, you know, I, I have a book on this, and even that might not be enough. And that's totally fair. No. Yeah, I was thinking a complete account of truth makers would basically solve all of my philosophical questions, right? What are properties? What are abstract entities? <laughs> what is ability and necessity, right? You're gonna have to cash all of that out and you're gonna basically do all of metaphysics. Sure. And Armstrong does have an answer for all those questions. I mean, he's one of the great metaphysicians. That's why he speaks uh, with such confidence, <laughs> despite the self-deprecation. Yeah. Which I love. I mean, I, I, if the, the ease with which he just tosses off uh, claims oh, yeah. and, and, and then occasionally says, I'm not going to go further on this point. That would be a bit much, but uh, maybe in another chapter, actually, it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I loved how he would even said like he changed his mind and and, and so and so taught him or you know, taught him the way of thinking or taught him the right. I just I just love the humility in which he would just kind of throw out passing comments about how he was wrong and now he thinks this. I just it was just so fluid the way he presented everything. It really, it really does feel. It almost feels dull, but I, I wasn't. You know, it wasn't dull at all, but it feels almost like it's almost like it's almost like reading a reference manual in uh, in something technical where, you know, it's just one definition after the next and that there's no narrative and that there's nothing exciting about it inherently. But you're so looking forward to using this tool that you're anticipating the fun you're going to have once you absorb everything you need to know. <laughs> Did you get that feeling? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I very much enjoyed at the bottom of section section two, um, very cleanly cut sections, by the way, really just appreciated the effort. Um, at the end of section two, being told that the paper we read for last week really is what put the conversation on the map. So it excuses all the all the frustration we had. You know, maybe it was written with an intent to just, uh, I don't know, address some random technical point that they didn't know for sure was gonna spark a huge debate. And so perhaps they had to go deeper just to justify it, you know? But um, yeah. But this was written what many about, years later. 
And so it has a, a, a cleaner feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. Armstrong said uh, he cited, uh, was it C.B. Martin, who first brought Truthmakers to his attention? Has anybody yeah. read that? No, I don't know who that is. I have no idea who that was. Okay. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't I've never I, heard I, the I name highlighted before, that actually. To try okay. and track down. I don't think he gives yeah. us a reference either. So. No, no reference. I haven't, I haven't tried to track it down yet, but I want to now. I love, the, I love the way it puts it, though. Yeah, everybody in Australia is talking about it. And always, it's always because of this Martin guy, or at least that's why I'm talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So. So he starts with the two questions, right? Which are sort of. Uh, yeah. Um, are questions which are, you know, about how uh, truth makers are supposed to relate to truths. Um, you know, the truth making relation is the name of the next section, right? So, um, right, and they're, they're questions of, uh, well, the, the first one is about, you know, do truth makers actually necessitate their truths or is, or is there some other metaphysical relationship between them, right? If you, if you have the truth maker, does that, you know, necessitate in some sense, which has to be explicated, right, um, the truth? Um, and you know, and then and then there's in some sense the reverse question, right? <laughs> Which is, uh, if you have a truth, uh, must there be a truth maker? Um, and uh, yeah, and so those are the realist, questions which shape the entire thing. Yeah, and as a realist, he says yes, yes to both. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, to both. Yeah. Which uh, I wonder how many uh, how many other major philosophers do so. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's very few. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not familiar enough with the landscape in this area, but I wouldn't be surprised either. Certainly, like a second think question. The... Well, there are real challenges with you know with the modal truths and mathematical truths. You know, also I suppose. Right. There are questions about ethical truths, <laughs> if you think there are such things. Uh, anyways, yeah, it's. I don't know right. how you can do that, because, I mean, if you take any mathematical truth, you, you might have the truth entailed by other propositions, but ultimately it has to bottom out with the truth maker, right, which is going to be something in the world. So I'm not. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that's going to work. Right. right after this call, we're all going to read that paper. Just to, you know, we really want to know. <laughs> yeah. I I, I I mean, does that make him necessarily like a nominalist? Is it that numbers are going to have to cash out as like concrete objects at some level? But how does I don't know. What are his options? I don't. I don't know. know what. I don't. I don't know what his theory uh, is. His philosophy of mathematics. That I would like to. That would be a question I would be interested in probing. Right. I mean, I guess it depends on the how, and and this is hinted at at the end how much we can how much we think is in reality, mm -hmm. right? Because you know, if you if you think that uh, numbers are part of reality, then they can be a truth maker in a pretty straightforward way, right? So right. Um, yeah, so that, that I think that's going to be the issue of, uh, you know, when he says, because, I mean, the basic idea is that he says at the very start of section three is the idea of a truth maker for a particular truth, then it's just some existent, some portion of reality in virt the virtue of which that truth is true. Right. Um, and so I was trying to think of, in the in the previous article that we read the um, with uh, Molly Simmons and Smith, that I, I think they suggested that there, that there might be is it that logical truths don't have truth makers necessarily because there's something about I might be misremembering right that you know that they're not made they're not made true something like a or not a might get its truth just from uh, the nature of propositions and and the fact that they're governed by logic they might not need yeah <laughs> you know you might need oh you might yes need, there is identity identity yeah, identity to go and the ask object. yeah <laughs> you, you know yeah. so if it's 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 the uh, uh, you know, the, the rose is red or the road is not red. You might not even need to go out and look at the rose to answer that one, right? So, uh, um, right. There was also uh, yeah, the so stuff it, about the so, uh, cats and humans. Uh, right. So, and, so maybe, uh, you know, as animals or whatever, right? And the implication, you know, what makes the implication statement true or whatever. 
Right. Uh, so yeah. So there. Yeah. So there might be some truth makers that so some truths don't have truth makers because you think that they, you know, they get their truth at the level of truth bearers somehow, or uh, or 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 you could think as as you said, like if he can, you know, if he if he doesn't think um, that you know numbers are abstract entities or universals or part of reality, then gotta explain how it the truth maker is something in reality for those kinds of claims. Right. Um, and I think he says something later in the paper about we might have to grant, you know, we, we, it might be very difficult to just say there are only objects and not properties and relations, uh, right? There's, there's certain kind of anomalism that's going to be very tough, to be honest, if you want to have this kind of realism about truth makers, right? You might, you might need more in your reality than that. But I don't know about numbers. I can't remember if he gives us any indication of how he's going to. Not really. You know, <laughs> explain the truth of two plus two is four. Right. Oh, that was the only thing about this. I, I liked it, but uh, a, a lot. Um, but the the modal stuff and the mathematical stuff was, yeah. was missing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> but right. that, well, that, does, that think... doesn't mean it's not in the book, though. Wait, so uh, yeah, we'll I might. To, we'll, we'll I think look. this wasn't this originally like an early chapter in a larger work, so it's you know yeah. it's not yeah it's not surprising if there's more yet to come. Okay, yeah, just while while you while you three are trying to figure things out, I, I actually did the research. It's, I found a paper called oh, yeah. Truth Makers for Modal Truths by David Armstrong. Hey. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I looked up I looked up the book. Uh, the ninth the ninth chapter is numbers and classes. Perfect. So. Oh. Yeah, yeah. He goes into it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe there's a paper on that too. Anyway. Um, yeah, let's uh let's uh let's see how far we get with what he does offer though. Right. Yeah. yeah so again, um, it's it's the uh, the two positions that he's going to be defending are truth maker necessitarianism, right, which is the <laughs> idea that the relation yeah. between truth makers and the propositions that make true is one of necessitation. And then the truth maker maximalism, which is um, uh, all truths have true make truth makers. So I expect you were all sufficiently satisfied with the reductio for the first question. Maybe not. Uh, yeah, the one on 117. Yeah, I thought that was pretty uh, convincing, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the reductio makes sense, but then, of course, it depends upon maximalism, right? Um, oh, that's an interesting right. point. So you can't even have it if you don't have maximalism. I didn't notice that. Yeah, yeah. It is It's... Yeah, it's interesting um, that these two principles would relate in this way. Um, but um, you know, and I mean, he he ends the, I guess, the introductory part of section three with, you know, saying, you know, what then is my argument uh, for maximalism? And then he starts the next paragraph. I do not have any direct argument. But he so actually he he actually does. Uh, it's just well, no, it's, he, just, he gives it's not just gives the motivation. No, no, I know, but 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 actually, I think there's an argument, uh, which is basically, give me any class of truths, and I'll give you the truth maker. He he, do, he doesn't say that he has the argument because of he course. doesn't actually give the truth maker for all the classes. You know, for many, he just says, ah, "I'll do with that some other time." But if he did manage all the classes, that would be the argument, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. He says, that "I'll give you a reasonably plausible account of truth makers for a variety of different kinds of truths." And Hope for the best. Hope they find the intuitive appeal of maximalism. So yeah, to stay wise. Right, but... right, right. Yeah, I mean, so you're right. So the argument is more like, um, I mean, inductive in a sense, right? Because he's going to go exactly. through. He says he's going to go through different categories of truths right. and give arguments for each one. Yeah, I mean, it might it might be worth going through why that 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 little argument um, for why for truth maker necessitation, right? So the idea is that, as he says, suppose suppose the truth maker T for a certain truth P fails to necessitate that truth, right? Then why does it, it fails to necessitate that truth P? It's called, um, it means that there's a possibility that you'd have the T, the chunk of reality, the truth maker, but not P be true, right? If it's not necessitated, then there's that possibility that P is not true. Um, so this suggests that there ought to be some further condition that must be satisfied in order to be, for P to be true in those circumstances, right? Um, let's. Uh, this condition must either be the existence of a further entity U, right, which would expand your truth maker, or a further truth, little Q, right, another a different proposition, 
um, in the first of these cases, you can just combine the two truth makers, right, T and U, um, and then you would have something that does necessitate, presumably, your P. If what it's needed to make P true, a circumstance where T doesn't do it, is that Q, that second proposition, then it itself presumably has a truth maker, which you could then add onto your T and make the truth maker. So if P, if Q doesn't have a truth maker, that's when this argument falls through, right? So, so that's why he needs to argue um, for maximalism, right? To show that if you have if you have a truth tape, a truth maker, it necessitates the truth that it makes true. Um, you know that. So if you have T, then P is going to be true. If P is the truth maker for P, for uh, P. And this, of course, depends. This depends on Q having a truth maker, uh, which explains right. The, right. the last sentence. Yeah. The truth will hang ontologically in the same sort of way that Rao left dispositional truths hanging. Otherwise, um, right? Yeah. Because if to, truth, if Q does have a truth maker, you can just throw it in with T, and then you just revise what your truth maker always was. Right. right. So. Uh, so then to the... Is that the, the concept of mind or something? Yeah, it's concept of mind. It's just where he complains about, where he says dispositions should not be taken to... Uh, well, he doesn't use the phrase truth makers, but uh, he does say almost... He, he pretty much says the same thing in other words. He says there should, it should, there should not be supposed to be something that answers for dispositional truths. There isn't some property of the sugar cube such that it would... Um, uh, for, which makes it true that it would dissolve um, other than uh, what we are entitled to say in given contexts, namely when it's in solution. Yeah, I don't, I'm not very familiar with that original debate, but I, I do vaguely remember um, Rao saying things like that. Yeah. So, um, So already we're seeing the bit about uh, T exists as the minimal case or a simple case rather, not minimal, a simple case uh, for which the truth uh, that an object makes is just the truth that that object exists. And he addresses the issue of, uh, I forget exactly, there being some redundancy. Okay, I, th I think what he's addressing here is why he's not compelled to admit to a one-to-one -one relation between truths and truth makers. Isn't that right? Or does that come later? Maybe this is just about it being cross-categorial. Right. So yeah, there's this business about uh, the relationship, the truth making relation being cross categorial, right? Yeah. Because the the truths and the truth makers aren't going to be necessarily in the same ontological category. Right. Yeah. One's a proposition. One's a chunk of reality. Right. And yet, the proposition is uh, itself. Well, is it a chunk of reality? I mean, it's not a pure abstraction, but he does, as he says later, want to be a naturalist and avoid anything too untethered. I mean, pres presumably you can, um, yeah, you can, you can make true statements about propositions so you, they can serve as truth makers, I suppose. So. Is that yeah. they are chunks of reality, but exactly. um, uh, but maybe propositions considered qua propositions have proposition have properties that they you know chunks of reality don't have. I just say that propositions are on on their way to numbers, and so the treatment of what makes statements about propositions true will need the special treatment that modal and or mathematical truths will require. Right. 
At any rate, um, I appreciate his having mentioned it and also his having explicitly said, it's so clean that um, that existence should uh, not be considered uh, a property following Kant, but that if it were, then there would have to be something distinct to make T exists true distinctly from anything else we might say about T. I thought that was really nice. It echoed my own uh, mixed messages last week as well. Mm. Existence. And he can't go into it, right? Because uh, that would require talking about modality and that's what he wants to put off. Um, oh, right. <laughs> So then there's the supervenient section. Uh, I thought, well, first of all, there's the slogan, right? Truth supervenes on being. Uh, right. Hmm. I, I liked that. I might have, I might have said um, that the truth maker relation is a relation between truths and reality. Uh, supervenience is stronger than perhaps what I had in mind. And being I take to be substitutable with reality. Uh, but otherwise it seems perfectly satisfying to me, especially since it's symmetrically supervenient. I wonder whether there can't, something can't be said about this uh, symmetric supervenience, almost uh, as if uh, it might collapse into something simpler. If it is symmetric, I didn't. I didn't really think about it very much. I just thought he's being very gingerly here in his uh, his treatment, just being sure not to overstep with what he can adequately defend in a few paragraphs. And I think he simply does so very, very correctly. And I'm happy to move on. <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is that I expect um, stronger things can be said, but I'm happy he didn't bother. Yeah, I think if it wasn't a, a cross categorical relationship, um, you might think that this reciprocal supervenience is just identity, or something like that. Exactly. Right. Yeah. That if you can't change one without changing the other, um, and you right. can't change the other without changing the one, you're basically dealing with one thing. <laughs> but this, uh, since since they're different things, right? Because one's a proposition and one's a chunk of of uh, reality. So you know that that I'm holding up my pen is a proposition and right. pen is a chunk of reality in my hand is a chunk oh, of reality. Oh, no, right? no, no, no. I think so. I understand now. It is, it is identity, or it would be if it were one-to-one -one in both directions. But because he's denying it's one-to-one, -one, because he's saying it's many-to-many, -many, then that's why it can't be identity. But additionally, well, it's because it's he doesn't want to... Well, hold on, hold on, also. hold on. Because he doesn't want to commit to any specifics about intentional objects. But if you make certain commitments, which he doesn't make, uh, then something like identity could emerge. Um, maybe if you like, if you think that yeah. intentional objects are ultimately chunks of reality too, or something like that. Exactly. Well, well if yeah. you think that, in fact, if you think that, that was, in fact, I was wondering who was, about his own view because I, from the little bit that I know about his metaphysics, you know, he, he has this whole system where uh, of a. Uh, the world as being a, a, you know, a bunch of uh, states of affairs, um, which is very close to being a proposition. I mean, some people. Right, yeah, I thought on, that was kind how, of interesting, the, the yeah. discussion about the difference between truths and facts or status of affairs. And um, it reminded me of a discussion I had re recently with a, um, a person who was insisting that, um, uh, you know, before, if there had never been any humans, there would be facts, but no truths, right? Because you needed, uh, you know, you need cognition to get propositions that then correspond to the facts. So, you know, so before there were minds, there were, there was nothing true about the universe, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah and uh, yeah, so I was kind of thinking of that. I don't think that, I don't think Armstrong would, would say that, right? Because as long as he addresses had, it, uh, the truth makers, yeah. Um, uh, they, you know, the truth makers don't, the propositions don't have to be thought by anybody or whatever. Yeah. So, okay. I thought about this for a while because um, 
this kind of me the intentional object aspect. So I thought if we have, you know, a, nat a naturalist account, a naturalized on a mind, um, it might just be that the mental, the intentional is just reference, right? You might have a natural, um, mm -hmm. naturalist account of, of, of reference. And so the propositions aren't just um, intentional states or mental states, but they would be sort of like meta references or references to what could be referenced, right? Like a, almost like a modal reference, not a, not like a, a modal truth, but a reference to what could be referenced. Um, so it would still be mind independent, but it would still be explicated in, in terms of something like reference, right? If, 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 okay. if mind theory might turn out to be something like, you know, representation where the content is determined by reference or something, and that's what the mental is. The propositions would be like meta references or potential references <laughs> that could be insane. right yeah because he does say that they're representational like the mind represents but then he says they represent opposition but it, you might think they represent surely the world right like that's part of right. what representation is is a representation of the world so right I mean, but I'm then i wonder if it does get down to something if it does get down to something like identity then because then it's like an instantiated reference to yeah. another world right so it's still right. like world to world not proposition to truth maker it's still the same you know world to world essentially or one part of world to another part of world right, right. And so then I wonder how the when we get to like the maximal truth maker stuff if that still works if the entirety of the world makes a proposition true but the proposition is a reference or a state within the world that refers to the world i, I mean true. i think that though even if we end up saying that propositions are uh, features of the world and they're ultimately defined by their own references, their own connections with the world, um, you know, in a certain, in, a, in an individual case, like um, the cat is on the mat, you can make this distinction between the proposition and an actual cat on an actual mat that's making it in those circumstances. Yeah. And, and so, there is, it seems to be there is a distinction there. You can, you can say, look, you know, if the cat got off the mat, then the proposition would no longer be true. Um, and if the proposition is no longer true, it's because something the cat's done something, right? You can't make the proposition false without moving the cat. You know, like so. There's that relationship between the two that they're mutually supervening. Um, so you know, if if yeah. if if the if the proposition is false, then the cat has gotten off the mat. And if the cat cuts off the mat, it makes the proposition no longer true, right? So there's this, super, but they are distinct because the proposition the cat is on the mat um, is something that I can say in various languages, but the cat on the mat can't be said in various languages. <laughs> like, you know, it's a chunk of reality. It's, just like, right. it's a feline on a particular woven but, surface. Yes, but I was thinking instead of moments, this actually might be a good motiv motivator for bringing tropes back in. So if tropes are abstract, particular, uh, he does say tropes. He, says, <laughs> he does say tropes, and he says that pro he says that uh, propositions are general, right? And right. so if you have something like an abstract particular that fixes the reference, you get that general pro um, aspect of the proposition referring to the particulars in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how to work that out, but that seems like a matter to maybe try to bring tropes in instead of something like moments. I, I, yeah, I wasn't I guess, sure what the we, difference between moments and tropes were anymore. Uh, I was having, I was thinking right. they were just uh, of different historical origin, but but leaning into the same uh, space. Uh, obviously, I was thinking of mental well, well, representations think... too. Uh, but um, I loved how he managed to avoid all of the controversial questions and say just enough to be able to speak generally about <laughs> truth makers without. Dry, grinding everything to a halt uh, on some point about which right. that would be general. I mean, it's just amazing to have uh, the four of us. I mean, I, I, we're all relatively close philosophically compared to the random person who reads philosophy. But but this but we have our differences, and it's amazing that he's able to skate around them and still say so much. Uh, I can easily think of how to extend right. what he's saying, but not without inviting um, uh, conversation right. stoppers. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think that a very important metaphilosophical point of how to basically not grind, <laughs> grind a position into the ground by being too overly specific too soon, right? Like, like, like last week, basically. <laughs> yeah. Although they were being exploratory, it's a different game. Uh, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. But but he he obviously at many times in this in this paper could have said what he thought truth makers are, like what actual chunks of reality make propositions, right. and he just doesn't right. do it because it's. 
Uh, that's amazing. I mean, that's incredible restraint. I mean, I'm sure he gets very specific in his book. To just right. That's what all the rest out. of the chapters are for. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, that's some incredible intellectual constraint, right? Like to, yeah. to, to act or restraint. So to not just like, you know, what he wants, he wants to say something and he's not saying it yet. Right. And that's and what's amazing is that despite the restraint, he says so much. I mean, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah. There's plenty well, to I've disagree done. with if you were so inclined. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also um, because he recognizes that different types of statements, different types of propositions, all right, will have different types of truth makers, right? Like there will be. Mm. So, so, so one thing I think that the the, the the previous we read, they wanted to try and come up with something that would work for all kinds of truths. So they yeah. came up with this weird thing, like a moment, which is an object that's like, like a dependent object, right? Like it, it you know, depends on the existence for something else. So it's like, um, you know, the smile on my face or, or whatever. And, and so the idea was they're kind of like, I guess, wrapping up an, both an object and a property in a, in a nice little package such that that one thing, that one concept, which they can brand, take, let's call a moment, will serve as a truth maker for all the truths, you know, logical ones or whatever we talked about. But the... You know, but I think for Armstrong, he's like, okay, a portion of reality, <laughs> but that, but that is going to be very different. You're going to be saying very different things. You're talking about a portion of reality that makes, um, you know, it could have rained yesterday, true, right, <laughs> or something like that, versus the portion of reality that makes the wine left in my glass, true, right. So, I mean, that one's really easy. It's right there. <laughs> that's, that's the portion of reality right there. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll see how long it lasts that portion of reality will taste so sweet going down now. um i might have to refill that portion of reality later <laughs> but anyway okay so so oh, yeah, it's gonna take it's, it's restraint but for a reason it's it's gonna take a, a giant like armstrong to pull off a sentence like this for all being, there is a proposition, perhaps one never formulated by any mind at any time, that truly renders the existence and nature of this being. When Wittgenstein said, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must be silent, he was perhaps suggesting that there were existences or aspects of existence that of necessity could not give rise to truths. At any rate, it seems that such a thesis can be held. <laughs> right. And this is... this yeah. is So much for Wittgenstein. <laughs> right. This is necessary for the reverse supervenience of yes or or one direction of the supervenience right so um so the supervenience goes um uh from truth supervening on being right um so if anything that had been true had not been true then being would have had to be different in some way right but then he also says being supervenes on truth for if anything that has being did not have being then something that is true would not be true. And so that implies that for every change in being there's a change in truth. Right. But you might say that if, if there are aspects of being that somehow um, slip through our propositional framework, right? They're too small or too beyond comprehension or whatever those could change a lot and the basic truths would still be true like the cats on the mat the, you know the the atoms are where the atoms are or whatever like if there there are so so you need this kind of expressibility i right that um for every, every piece of being in the universe you know there couldn't be a change there that couldn't be captured by some proposition you know uh tell it like it is Right, that our our, our propositions yeah. can't are, are are potentially fine grained enough to track any change in being. Um, yeah. We we should right? we, should, we shouldn't say powerful. We shouldn't say not our not propositions. Our. Yeah, right. just yeah, propositions right. generally. Our, yeah, propositions generally. Right. Yeah, and that's why. Um, that's why this is a very different view from the person I was talking to, who was uh, who was just insistent that you you know in his minds you can't have propositions because. You know, well, especially, you know, if you think propositions are things that people have beliefs about, right, then it's going to be constrained by their conceptual framework, all that stuff. So it's on what can be conceptualized, and that will form the limits on what could be a proposition, and then uh, that will uh, form right, limits right, right. on the, the, you know, the grasp of propositions on reality. So a lot could happen in reality that's sort of below the surface and just is not even touched by our propositional um, 
Well, ineffability okay. has been a longtime fashionable position, but it has always struck me as strange that those who insist on ineffability find themselves able to talk about it. Right. I wondered <laughs> if, and I think he talks about this later, if there's also a principle of exhaustibility that comes along with this, such that, because um, uh, it seems to me that for any proposition, um, you know, is there is there a, a particular, is there a definable chunk of reality that, that makes that true? Or is there always like, more than one possible <laughs> chunk of reality making that true. I like, is it? Right. Um, yeah. It, you can you know, so I think he's, he goes into, yeah. 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 So I think that that, that sort of comes up when he talks about the minimum. He goes into it, but he also, although he doesn't say this very, uh, he, he doesn't mark out a whole section to make this point, but he does say or suggest that, um, that, that, that the truths for which there is a unique minimal truth maker do, uh, collectively constitute a supervenience base for all the other truth maker relations. Again, I'm not sure if he says that explicitly, but I think he suggests it. Do, do, do you remember something? Do you remember something like that? Uh, I remember a reference to something called sparse propositions. No, it's much later. Sparse properties. Uh, oh, okay. I'll mention it again when it comes to it. I, I highlighted okay. it. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah the part where it says even if there's a, a minimal truth maker, it will still be a truth maker for other propositions. That that one? No, later. In fact, I'll find it right now. Just give me a second. It's right at the end. Um, well, I, well, quickly, I was going to say I really like this expressibility that he's going at here because it it, it kind of um, kind of justifies conceptual analysis and, and the rationalist. Uh, conception of of productive thinking, you know, a la a photo. This idea that if you have mental states that have propositional contents, you could reason your way to new propositions. And there's a reason to believe that those propositions actually do express truths because there's something about the other propositions that are made true by the world and they entail other propositions that are in turn made true by truth makers. And it gives us reason to believe that those thoughts that we think are our way to actually are made true by reality. And then the propositions that you, you think aren't because of something about the propositions, but maybe uh, the inaccessibility of those truth makers, right? So right. if you don't have access to those truth makers, you don't have access to those propositions. And so you get this great theory of, mm -hmm. you know, causal uh, account of content for, for mental states, and you get this beautiful rationalist, you know, Fedorian language of thought potential kind of justified in yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are ready. <laughs> well, I, I'm i drinking, but I can't prove it. Ooh, fortunately, I still have some of this chunk of reality left. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just, I, I love this idea that. Oh, you found it. Okay, good. good. Yeah, it's the last couple of sentences of section 14 on 132. He says, Let the world be a world of things. The fundamental truths, those that have unique minimal truth makers, will then have the form, quote, X exists, unquote, and the X's, whatever they may be, will be the truth makers for these truths. So if the world is made up of, um, I mean, if, 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 if the world is just things and the truth makers are in the world, then um, it seems to follow that all truth makers will supervene on these minimal truth makers these unique minimal truth makers. So take, take, a, take a disjunction, like uh, grass is green or snow is white. Uh, that can be made true by either disjunct, which is more evident if I said something like snow is red and grass is green. But, um, but it won't have a minimal, especially if both disjuncts are true, it won't have a unique minimal truth maker, right? But it will supervene right. on unique minimal truth makers, namely, the truth maker for grass is green and the truth maker for snow is white. So even though of the truths, many won't have unique minimal truth makers, the class of truths that do have unique minimal truth makers are special because altogether they form a supervenient space for all the other truths and truth makers. Again, he doesn't claim right. that, so but those two the, sentences seem to suggest it. Right, that's for 
yeah, sort of throwing a bone to those who might want to say that the world is only um, uh, a world of things, not facts, right? Because he seems to be talking about facts as playing the role of truth makers. But he said, okay, if you say there are no such thing as facts, there's only things, you can still have um, things serving as truth makers as I've defined it, for, uh, Armstrong you know, has defined it for um, existence claims, those minimal existence planes and build from there, I guess, but yeah. But. I see what you're saying. So maybe it won't be a supervenient space if you happen to think that there are facts other than um, what right. is given the, by there a are world facts of and relations and properties as well as yeah. as well as um, yeah. But remember atoms. that he thinks yes. But remember that he thinks that those are concrete, um, and so may may well themselves be uh, things. We'll have to read more. I, it was just a thought, and maybe he left it out because of his restraint, which is what we're supposed to be respecting, right? So maybe I should have some restraint too. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. The next section I loved. I've I've for I've forever been looking for a, a nice little intuition for what it is to be an internal relation, and I've come across various definitions, none of which I ever remember, but I finally found one, and he gives it to us right at the end. Um, an internal relation is one that you have just between the two relata. You know, when, when you have the two things being related, just between the two of them, you've got your relation. You don't have to, as he says, um, there's no addition of being. Given just the terms, we're given the ontology of the situation. The relation is not something over and above its terms. I really liked that. Yeah. It doesn't have to add relations to the theory. I mean, not the internal relation, not 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 on account of the truth-making relation anyway. But if propositions are intentional objects, I suspect he'll eventually have to say more than just that, right? Because this is a special type of necessity or intention, not entailment. But then, if propositions as intentional objects are entailment star, uh, it seems like he's going to have to say more than just this at some point. Well, I don't see why, unless you think that uh, the ontology of intentional objects is in any way, it will be in any way, well, ontologically problematic. Well, I'm not sure what the nature of the intentional relation is between, an, uh, sorry, an internal relation between an intentional object and a truth maker. Um, well, the, the point is just that you won't have to add anything to the world in order to explain it. Right. Look, the point is it won't be yeah. a causal relation. <laughs> no, that, that's what I'm getting at. I, I think it for a... a <laughs> I know you like your causal theory of content, of, and I like it too, but this is not that. This is well, just in causal virtue of... Properties, causal, causal theory of, of content. Um, I, I want to make it all work together, so I think maybe I'll have to say more ultimately. I'm not sure. Yeah, if he doesn't, then great, but I don't know. Huh. Yeah, you might you, you might be able to bring calls back into it for the epistemology. No, before that. Before okay, that. well, we'll come back to it. Well, I'm thinking of a level of reference. So even before. Um, no, I think you have it with. I think you'll need it with reference. I agree with you there. Uh, maybe he doesn't. I'm not sure. Oh, I see what you're saying. So if if the intentional object needs causation for. A, for the reference relation, then perhaps that makes it no longer an internal relation. Is that what you're thinking? Right. So, I mean, broadly, how I think of propositions are something like logical structure plus reference. Um, yeah, right, right. And, me too. Right. So if you're, I think ultimately you, you have to explicate this reference, but you also have to explicate this, this, this necessitation relation. And if you just want to say it's just this internal um, or sorry, this, this internal relation, I'm, I'm not sure you've really said enough about Is reference. It is it logical structure plus reference or something that has logical structure and reference? Oh, like it refers in virtue of its structures, you mean? Like it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that which it refers to, right? It has an independent ontological status. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, right, presumably. Because um, I, mean, I think is, is, the, is the worry here that I mean, the, so the idea here is that um, the relation of, um, you know, my Apple pencil is on my head to this state of affairs <laughs> is um, you just say, 
you say, uh, what does he say? You say um, the terms of the relation, or you say this state of affairs right here. Um, oh wait, no, there's an order here. He says a certain real object and a certain proposition. So this this thing going on right here and the proposition, my Apple Pay pencil in my is on my head. Uh, and then you've got a necessitation relationship between the two, right? That this makes it true that the, my Apple pencil is on my head. Um, you don't need to, you don't need a third thing like one of them cohering with something else. And then your but your concern is that the proposition itself, my Apple pe pencil on his head, is what it is in virtue of relations. Well, because so remember those later, get, later those get those get into this equation. Well, later he does bring in coherence, not as a definition of truth, but he says something like a a, a form of truth or something. I forget how he says it exactly, but there's still going to be this this coherence account of of, of truth. There's this coherence between propositions and uh, states of affairs Josh, facts. No, 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 Josh. I, or, I, th I think you've I think you've convinced me. Uh, if you read that first sentence, it should be noted. He says that if, as argued, the truth making relation is a necessitating relation, then it is internal. Is it? It is an internal relation. So, if we deny that it is an internal relation in virtue of the uh, the terms of the proposition having to be given by a causal relation which uh, is then no longer internal, then is, is the relation between the intentional object and the truth maker no longer a necessitating relation? And I think one way out of this well, might be to say that the intentional object expresses the proposition perhaps rather than is the, pro well, a, a, no, let me, let me, let me, no, like maybe there's, maybe there's a little bit more interaction between the intentional object and the Fedorian sense uh, and what might be abstracted from many intentional objects, which is closer to what Armstrong wants from a proposition. And in that abstraction, we get rid of the causal issue. But it, it well, how about if the, for the, for, for an important class of truth makers, the, um, this, this relationship can be internal to what, I mean, can be internal to those two things. So if I say, um, I know we all have one that's seemingly identical, but this pencil exists, right? This Apple pencil exists. Um, then I've got two things, this and a proposition, this Apple pencil exists. And maybe I can get the, the relationship. There's enough there that I can get all this content that you're worried about in internal to that relationship. Relationship between this and this Apple Pencil exists. Okay, I'm fine with that. But what comes to mind is the Shoemaker paper on necessity, the, the metaphysical, um, what was it, logical, and what was the third necessity? Um, but what comes to mind is, it, it seems to me what, what Armstrong has in mind here is something what like Shoemaker has in mind with metaphysical necessity, which I think he reduces to logical necessity, which then would allow Shoemaker to say something like this necessitation relationship might actually be closer to entailment that Armstrong thinks can work because entailment can't hold between you know, chunks of reality and propositions. But if this necessitation- Oh, that's even better. No, that's even better. Because then you can have internal right? relations that are causal. Exactly, exactly yeah. right. And you have entailment that holds between chunks of reality and propositions if what that link is, is metaphysical um, mm -hmm. necessity. Oh, I well, like that. Have, so Shoemaker plus you Armstrong. Have, you have the arrow, yeah. but I don't yeah. know if you have. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I, I got to take Armstrong's point that you, you I don't know that it, that it is entailment if one thing is not a proposition. I, I mean, you have to do things like wave your pencil, right? It's like this chunk reality and a proposition. Right. I mean, I'd have to review this. The shoemaker. pencil exists. Right. No, I'd, I'd have to review. But so it does. <laughs> Entail this pencil exists. Right, but what I, I'm saying I don't is, know. I don't know how to. What I'm saying that. ultimately, to, to naturalize an account of reference, we, we can't just have like the world and the mental being distinct, and we can't have intentional objects and chunks of reality. There's, there's going to be something natural about propositions that's just not distinct from chunks of reality. And once you start going down that road, you're going to be able to say more about this necessitation relationship. And yeah. saying that it's metaphysical necessity might be that ticket out and then you can actually say it's not you know some kind of necessitation and then also some kind of entailment not you know classical entailment you can say that well maybe logical necessity was metaphysical necessity and maybe that's why chunks of reality has this relation to propositions and then you can actually right. maybe right. present 
I, know, I like what you're saying. Yeah, so, I, I, so, so basically, this cross-categorial aspect of the truth-maker relation is just a rough draft until we can, uh, yeah, you know, deepen uh, right. the the proposition side. Right. The cross-categorial nature of it might dissolve as a, a, a more fleshed-out, you know, theory of propositions with, you know. <laughs> not just not just bottoming it out as you know intentional object and that's all i'm going to say at this point if you yeah. say more then you might actually be able to say more about this entailment necessitation difference here yeah i think that's okay. fair um and it's also fair to push off right because that would take Absolutely. us into mind and language <laughs> and this is hard enough, <laughs> yeah. enough. <laughs> you know we're not doing mind and language we're doing metaphysics i think uh because truth is often thought of as mind and language but uh I mean, he's, take, he's taking us down the metaphysics side of it. Well, I guess, okay, so, the, so yeah, okay, that's clear. Truth maker is the metaphysics side. Truth is the mind and language side. He's doing the right-hand side. Yes, and I think he even says that at some point. Yeah, right? he does, he does. I think so. Yeah. Okay, false makers. This has always been my biggest worry. Um, and, well, it won't surprise you to hear that I just loved his solution, even though it's sketchy. <laughs> it's better than anything I had in mind. <laughs> Um, yeah. No, actually, now, I, I isn't this sorry. I was gonna say, isn't this similar to what the the three people last week proposed that um, false propositions are made false by truth makers, positive truth makers? Isn't that a similar position? Oh yeah, he said that that was his position, but he now sees that there might be some interesting roles for false makers. But, but that false makers are ultimately still just truth makers, right? Um, well, he talks about truths of impossibility. Mm. Suppose it's true that it is impossible that P and not P both be true, but necessary that one of the conjects be true. The truth maker for the true conjunct will simultaneously be false maker for the other conjunct. Right. Right. Um, no, I don't, I don't think the... the not sure exactly how that is uh, different I, from the. I don't, I don't like the solution that uh, no, you know. I'll take it back. I think I have a better idea, uh, and and I thought so at the time. But I just thought he was suggesting something close to my idea, and even better, which is why I came away admiring it instead. But uh, I I deny that uh, that um, that that false makers. Well, I just don't think the truth, I think the bigger problem is not so much false makers, but rather the truth makers for negations. And I don't see the truth makers for negations being um, straightforward at all. Uh, he gives two suggestions, uh, one which he then dispenses with, which I appreciate, and then one which is very suggestive. And they're both in the last paragraph. Um, let's just re review. He says, uh, so consider a certain wall is painted green, seems reasonable to suppose that the greenness is some sort of positive property. And the walls having that property is the truth maker for that truth. Now, but consider now the further truths that the wall is not white, not red, and so on. One might suggest uh, that the wall makes these truths true by being a false maker for the corresponding positive attributions of color. But this in turn, this in turn may encourage the idea that it is not necessary to postulate negative truth makers for negative truths. Uh, yeah, so I, I prefer um, I prefer to go modal on this one and basically just speak of those possible worlds at which the the wall is not green. Find the truth makers there, and I know that that's yeah, it's it's unattractive in its own way because you're you're introducing modality to deal with the truth function. But there's something special about negation that makes me that motivates me to do that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure how the I kind of want I just a positive possible theory. worlds. Yeah. No, I know, I know. That's gonna to be tough. But and I don't really have I mean, my my intuitions are all gonna be Lewisian, but I'm pretty compelled to go with him in denying Lewisian propositions. And I'm not sure I remember Armstrong's treatment of modality. So I don't know what's gonna happen, but but I can see myself being pushed into a corner already. 
I'm, I'm so ready to ditch our current truth maker book track and just make it an Armstrong track. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, gotta be flexible. <laughs> you know, I do want to know now how we, we know what is treatment of, of, you know, modality and possibly just possibility is here. I'm, I'm very curious and, and, and how he deals with this specifically in negation. Um, yeah, I, I really want to, I, I want to read more. <laughs> hmm. So why is the why is the why exactly is it that the uh, that it's with uh, you know impossible uh, statements or statements of impossibility that false makers seem more? I can't. I don't understand that paragraph now that I read read it through. I'm not sure what it's adding to what it was said before. Exactly. About, I mean, I feel like um, this is definitely around uh, you know in the air still to this day. I feel like because people are you know they want these things like impossible worlds to talk about. I don't know. Yeah. So like I, uh, only thing I took away was he was against false makers and then he thought, wait, actually they do serve a function. And then the section is, <laughs> well, no, I mean, he says you can check out my book chapter eight. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, this, section, <laughs> yeah, this I section ends. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I, I guess the, the simultaneously is supposed to be important there in that paragraph, but I'm not sure. How is that what makes it different from the case where if something is a false maker for P, false maker for P, then again, it is a truth maker for the contradictory of P, right? Uh, yeah. Oh, well, no, but this is interesting though, because even if there is a false maker here, it's still a positive. It's still, it's still the same thing, which is the truth maker for one of, for the P or whatever, let's say. Right. right. For one of the conjuncts. Oh, okay. It isn't. So, it, it 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 isn't that it's some you know extra you know ontological posit over and above the you know the truth makers for the. Uh, oh, oh wait a minute! No, I'm right? saying this differently. Is now. that right? I'm saying this differently now. Uh -huh. I'm saying maybe okay. So maybe if we if we admit false makers, we deal with negation, and that's it. So basically, you know, P has its truth maker, uh, and not P has its false maker. Just don't go looking for false makers when P is false. You see? Yeah, right. Yeah. Wait, so false makers make negations true, but don't look for false makers for false propositions? Is that what you're saying? That he said? For false propositions that aren't negations, yes. Right. Right. Well, is what he's trying to say like that, uh, so, you know, we have this conjunction P and not P. I think what he's trying to say is, well, if, if say, uh, he says, nece but necessarily that one of the conjuncts uh, is, is true, um, which just sounds like the law of the middle. Um, but so if, you, if we, you know, suppose that P is true, then P's truth maker is what makes not P false. And, and conversely, not P is true, then not P's truth maker is what makes P false. Right. Yeah. Does that make sense? In other words, the truth maker of a true statement is the false maker of its negation. Right. right. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. If um, which explains the impossibility, which explains the law of the excluded middle, basically. By, by, by basically, it explains negation in terms of the relation between truth makers and false makers. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not, you know, it's still going to be, it's not like it's some extra class of entity. <laughs> no, it's the same entity. Yeah, it's the same entity. So, you're not, you know, positing some weird, you know, round squares or something like that, right? Or gold mountains or whatever. Yeah, this isn't right? about impossible worlds. Not yet, that's later. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it's, it's, it's I mean, it's very unsatisfying to me to, to rely on contraries that aren't logical contraries. Yeah, well, but these are logical contraries, right? No, um, I know, I know, but right, later but when not, he says not, like red not and white. Not the green wall example. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. So he's this, you know, he re registers a reservation that you might have. 
Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And and he says that 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 the, the example might suggest that um, you can have negative you can have um, truth makers for negative truths that are not negative themselves. But um, he says he's going to uh, find well, I, this 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 position ultimately unsatisfactory if you go ahead and read chapter five point two point one. So we're not sure what his ultimate answer is on this, but probably not. He probably doesn't think that. He, he might think that you need a negative truth maker for a negative truth. I don't know. We will see. So, I'm not sure what a negative uh, truth is. A truth maker that makes a negative statement. Okay. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I think I have to read chapter 5.2.1. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I, I think it still works even with the contraries because. You know, it's just whichever one of them is true, the, the truth maker of that thing makes all of the other ones, all of the incompatible. Right, but it depends on, false. it depends on incompatibilities, which are not um, necessary relations and uh, necessary truths. Well, it We're depends on, about. well, well, I guess, well, it depends on what you mean by necessary here, right? Because logically necessary, like, I don't take it to be necessary that something can't be both red and green not logically necessary yeah right i mean i guess but you know i mean i guess there's a there is a question that i had at the back of my mind through a lot of this which was whether or not um it sort of came up earlier um you know whether or not metaphysical necessity if it's distinct from logical necessity is enough to understand the necessitation at play here Sure, but but then it would depend on the metaphysics of color as opposed to the metaphysics of truth, and I would like it to depend only on the latter. I don't know. I'm, I'm out of my depth. I'm. I'm, I'm well, I mean, it would depend fast. on the metaphysics of whatever the the truth makers are, right? <laughs> you know, because there will be yeah, that would that would be a way to make it work. That's true. I, yeah. I, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to th try to. I mean, because you know, one, two you know, paragraphs into uh, three pages. Uh, I no, I know, I know, I know. It's just stuff I have. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. But but I think we're all worried about the same thing. Um, I mean, I take yeah. this mainly to be a motivation to read the book. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, sure. But but I but I do feel uh, some satisfaction uh, in having progressed from where I was uh, in in being able to recognize truth makers as false makers as a way to deal with negation. Uh, even mm -hmm. if it doesn't answer all the problems that it raises. Okay, uh, entailment. So this is the first tricky bit. Uh, it's kind of a long section, but mainly just to make room for his dealing with math in a more interesting way later. Right? Mm. He's, um, I think, wanting to say two things. One, that the, the old idea of, or maybe this is a different section. Is this where he talks about containment? I think so, yes. Yeah, classical entailment. Uh, uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Containment. No, oh, there it is. Oh, it's right there. Yeah, no, it is. It is. So, yeah, it, it, he's relating contain, containment in the mirrorological sense to yeah. uh, entailment. And um, I think that's very powerful uh, in that truth maker theory might expand to uh, inferential validity theory. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So uh, without going into it, he says, but let's get math out of the way. And he tries to do that by talking about contingent versus necessary truths. And then there's like partially contingent, pure contingent. Uh, and he, he makes an effort to make courses for courses, uh, but uh, does not go the way of other philosophers who want to just accept that perhaps the necessary truths, the mathematical truths and logical truths 
don't have special truth makers, that maybe there's just one truth maker for all of them, or maybe they don't even have truth makers. He, he wants to do something better than that. He says he wants to provide relevant truth makers for all the truths. And then later it says a purely contingent truth maybe is, a, is one that is contingent through and through, uh, but admits that he isn't sure exactly how to make that work. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, I think it would be more obvious, not more obvious. I think it might be more apparent how to make it work when he tells us what it is that he wants to do with the lot with the necessary truths. Yeah, I it, it's hard for me to understand what a relevant truth maker would be that necessarily makes true two plus two equals four. I well, namely something to do with the number two, obviously. I mean, the number yeah, three should have nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But there's some some relevant and maybe minimal, probably not minimal, but well, no. I mean, the, the most obvious the most obvious thing is you know what what people like Frigga and Russell tried to do, right? Where you you think of uh, that's two two as in some sense having to do with the pairs, yeah, as yeah, real but... pair real pairs of things, right? But they're as opposed yeah, to right. real trios of things or real you know right. So well, so not, yeah. that's like real pairs, yeah. like actual pairs of things. Sure, or perhaps yeah. possible ones. I don't know because it right. seems to be a necessary truth, right? So right. perhaps right. possible pairs or something. Right, it's comparing apples what... and pears though, you can't. Right, <laughs> but I think I think the. Yeah, I think the important the important part of this section is that he give us any indication of what the truth makers will be for necessary truth. But he just says, um, I'm gonna, I want to commit myself to this entailment principle. And I think it has interesting lessons for the, you know, our understanding of validity and things like that. But um, I'm not gonna let, I, I don't think that this entailment pr principle makes the truth makers for necessary truths easy, right? So how does that go? Well, if you look at the entailment principle on 120, it's if some state of affairs T um, has this truth maker relationship, right? This non-propositional necessity relationship with some proposition P. So if T leads to P and P entailed something else Q, then T is a truth maker for Q. But because if P is a contingent proposition, it will entail every necessary truth, right? Right, Because you yeah. can't have a TF case. Right. That would make anything like me putting my, you know, <laughs> Apple pencil back on my head, right? This, this situation, right? This situation makes, me is, back makes, back. makes two plus two <laughs> equal four. Yeah. Right. True. It's a truth yeah. maker for two plus two equals four. Right. right. And it'll, so that, it'll, yeah, it, it's also a truth maker for water is identical to H2O. <laughs> or what, yeah, whatever you, you think could be the, the necessary truth <laughs> to be, right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so he, um, he says, well, look, okay, no, I think this entailment principle is important for, uh, you know, my, for, for truth maker, th my theories of, right, <laughs> my truth making theory. But, um, uh, it, it maybe need to be restricted to purely contingent truths, right? Where yeah. a purely contingent truth is one that does not contain any necessary, you know, necessary con conjunct, right? Um, so yeah, so you, and the, the, why the purely? Because I could say, okay, well here, um, I'm gonna say um, Q is, my Apple pencil is on my head and two plus two is four. And now the situation is a truth maker for that whole thing, right? You know, like, because it's contingent, it's contingent, right? It depends on my Apple pencil being on my head, which it no longer is. So yeah, so yeah, so then, yeah. We don't want my Apple pencil being on my head being any kind of truth maker for two plus two equals four, right? So that's why you have that, that constraint. Yeah, I wonder if this can be obviated so that we could go ahead and use entailment rather than entailment star. If yes the proper philosophy of mathematics yes. um, does away with, uh, you know what I mean? Like maybe some yeah. kind of mathematical oh. structuralism and gets out of this problem. Yep. But I think it's fair for him not to want to deal with it. Again, I think this is kind of indicating at the need for um, a sort of unification project between, you know, the way the you know, shoemaker kind of sets out to show a metaphysical necessity is logical necessity. And again, I need to review that paper because I forget what he did, but. <laughs> what was the name of that paper? Uh, I think it was three types of necessity by shoemaker, something like that. Oh, interesting. Okay. Physical necessity, I think. Well, 
I think no. the star, the star here is just the, wait, the star here is that entailment is restricted to purely contingent relationship between P's and Q's. Well, well no. Mining, he, it's, about mining just... your P, it's about minding your P's and Q's. It's not about whether or not the arrow between T and P is entailment, because it's not. It's non-propositional necessity. But T and P is not entailment, but he, he says that even between P and Q, it's, it's non-classical entailment. Right? right. It's not classical entailment because it rules out uh, necessary uh, truth. Well, right, because this is, because if T is a truth maker for P and P entails Q, then T would be a truth maker for Q. Right. So, if, so well, it's, no, a that, sort of it's a case. sort of relevant entailment or something? It's, it's yes, it's, it's, it's relevant entailment. Oh, okay, okay, <laughs> relevant, okay. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Well, you, so, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I Seeing this and thinking about, um, yeah, it makes so much sense, actually, like that uh, Graham Priest is from Australia uh, <laughs> because, because uh all of these guys uh, were talking about these uh, deep and difficult metaphysical conundrums about, you know, necessary and uh, impossible statements um, and uh, Meinongian ontologies and trying to avoid Meinongian ontologies and stuff. And relevance, it seems to be the thing which is required. Um, so, so maybe it's, yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, and, and, and it's certainly relevance entailments are what, are most intuitive to most students of logic. Like it drives them nuts that um, right. you, know, well, actually, you, can, you can say right. any P and then say that right. if, you know, if the sky is blue, then two plus two is four and you've created a true sentence and it just drives them nuts. You know, like yeah. what, what kind of entailment? So you have to get them to, you know, get them to accept this kind of entailment. So yeah, so yeah, some sort of relevance, uh, it, it, it's not, you know. So that's the restriction there, yeah, between- uh, Proof by undergraduate intuition, I love it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, the, the, but, paper, the paper is Causal and Metaphysical Necessity. We read it long ago. And then the other one was The Nature of Possibility uh, by Armstrong. Okay. Yeah, so that might, yeah, that might be relevant. So the, anyway, but I think, uh, um, I'll have to read The Shoemaker. You guys right. keep bringing him up. I only read one paper by him and it was like, it was great. So I, I'll have to read it. He's my spirit animal. He's your spirit animal? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. We've been funny. reading about spirit animals, haven't we, Kenny? Oh, God. <laughs> it's true. Right. Yeah. But I think that, so this, I mean, I think this section is important because it's, it's, it's opening up the idea that, that there can be relationships between, um, uh, truth makers and like more than one proposition and you know like so something being a truth maker for one proposition uh may also make it a truth proposition a, a truth maker for propositions that that proposition is related to right um and so you know if we uh, you know and this seems particularly the case if we rule out these you know tricks of entailment which make everything imply a necessary truth right um so yeah. Um, right. He he ends saying, you know, for example, an important point to keep in mind about the entailing principle is that even where T is a minimal truth maker for the entailing proposition P, it will not necessarily be a minimal truth maker for the entailed Q. Right. So we're we're seeing these connections between truth makers and different possible propositions, and and that they, this this entailment principle is, you know, one of the ways we negotiate those relationships. Um, yeah. Right. So if if a certain feature of the world, uh, you know, makes it true that the cat is on the mat, then it makes the proposition the mammal uh, a mammal is on the mat true or whatever, right? You know. So there are these connections between truth makers and a variety of different propositions. You know, the, the more you say, the more I worry, Karen, that we need to make a case for a concern for relevance. Uh, of course, relevance is interesting in its own right, but I'm not sure what role it plays for truth and truth making. I, I, I have some ideas of what Armstrong wants from it, but I wonder if we want too much more broadly speaking. <clears throat> I've always sure. been kind of curious to dip into it, but I've never really known where to start. <sighs> well, maybe this is the Well, place. I think, I think, th I mean, it's going to, yeah. uh, it, it, uh, pr pr presumably the interesting things that he's going to have to, that he's going to say are going to, come out when he talks about eventually what the truth makers might be for some necessary truth, right? Um, because if, if with this entailment truth, you know, if 
if Trimaker for plus two is four, is is anything you want, anything that's true, right? Um, you know, then that does seem too that does seem too broad, right? So so what does he mean by relevance? Well, let's see what he says does make two plus two equal four, and then we'll get some sense of what he means by relevant. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I just want to know what he thinks makes. I mean, I have my own ideas about what makes two plus two equals four, namely everything. But more can be said yeah. about this, of course. Okay. Uh, sure. But I don't know that it would be relevant to chip maker theory. It's more hmm. about math. It's more about philosophy math. By the way, I want to do some readings on structuralism. Anyway, uh, so the next section is well, what would the hell are propositions? Before we get too deep into truth makers, oh, sorry, yeah, what are truths rather? Truths are um, true propositions, but what are propositions? What are the truth bearers? And he says, um, after a little bit of history, he says, I like the list of candidates. It's helpful. Yeah, yeah, you want to read them? From, uh... So the candidates are, and the nominees are. <laughs> <laughs> the nominator, the nominees for truth bearers are beliefs, propositions. propositions, judgments, assertions, statements, theories, remarks, ideas, acts of thought, utterances, sentence tokens, sentence types, sentences unspecified, and speech <laughs> acts. This should give us all pause, he says. <laughs> And the Truth Bearer Award goes to, the Armstrong Truth Bearer Award goes to. <laughs> proposition. Goes to. <laughs> <laughs> which are, which are, which are. Which are intentional objects uh, of beliefs and certain thoughts. Yeah. We might have just have said of thoughts. Um, right. Yeah, on the mental side, he says. On the linguistic side, it's, it's of the statements. And then he says, I don't really want to say much more than that. Yeah. Oh, he does say, you know, he, he as a naturalist, he, he wants a this worldly account of propositions, right? So he's not positing a realm of entities, a third one or anything. Um, so well, he'll say a little bit more than nothing. Yeah, and I'm very happy that elsewhere, I don't know if it's related to your point. I think it is. He says that by abstraction, he means it in the classical sense and not in the um, Quinean sense right. of not spatio-temporal. So on, right. if, if we link those two thoughts, propositions here may yet be abstract, but not otherworldly. So when, when in the classical sense, he doesn't mean like the platonic sense, right? No, I think it means Aristotelian. It means Aristotelian. Aristotelian. Okay. And the Aristotelian so, sense um, of abstraction just means uh, taking properties away. Well, and he... He says that that the content or meaning is an abstraction becomes clear when we notice that contents and meanings are types rather than tokens. Yeah. So it's it, yeah, it's it's the abstraction in which, you know, um, type dog is an abstraction from all the dogs. Maybe it doesn't mean that it exists in the world, the platonic world of the forms, but it just means it's a, a type, not a token. But the Aristotelian sense is that a, a particular dog is. How does he cash it out? It, it, it's it's it, it's it's cashed out in concrete form, right? Like actual dogs um, are dogness, something like that. They're they not thinking in the, He you know he's famous for for a theory of universals. So uh, we could go there eventually. I can't tell you what it is though. I don't know. I have never got around to it. Um, I I I, I uh, at the bottom of one twenty two is where I first sort of put an asterisk for this worry that in cashing out what an intentional, which I think Joshua has been echoing, when you, when you finally cash out what an intentional object is, you might end up um, basically reducing it to, 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 to truth makers or a relationship between the mind and truth makers. Because he says, um, which might make the account I don't know, some circular. I, I don't want to read too much into, okay, say, the preliminary suggestion is that propositions are the intentional objects of beliefs and certain thoughts. That is on the mental side. On the linguistic side, they're the, the intentional objects of statements. I do not want to read too much metaphysics into the phrase intentional objects. Beliefs are essentially beliefs that something is the case. Whatever is believed to be the case may then set, be said to be the intentional object of that belief. But if I believe my dog is on the sofa, 
you might say in one sense, I believe, um, you know, this, right? you know? <laughs> not a proposition. Right? So, so, right. and, and, and this is the truth maker. Right. Right. So, yeah. Anyway. Right. So what you believe is the thing that makes no, but you, but you don't. No, but you're no, yeah. you're, you're taking advantage of, uh, of of. No, you don't believe your dog is on the sofa. You believe that your dog is on the sofa, and we leave the word that out implicitly. But whatever is believed believe. to be, that, right. that's says whatever is believed to be the case. To be the case, <laughs> and what I right. believe to be the case is the truth maker, right? <laughs> no, I don't. So yeah. Think anyway, but so. yeah. Anyway, okay. I, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, yeah. Some people do have theories that are sort of like that. I don't know if Armstrong is one. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, we did I, kind of discuss it by suggesting that that symmetric supervenience might cash out into some kind of identity. So it's right. not an accident yeah, sure. that we're going down this path. Right. Well, and that he thinks that the world is, a, is this sort of like, you know, jumble of states of affairs, right? I mean, this mass, you know, in some sense. Yeah. That actually seems to suggest maybe that, that he does. Right. I've yeah. never so understood once, yeah. that. Yeah. That, that, is, that is what you have. That is what you have in mind. Sure. I mean, I've never understood the phrase "states of affairs," <laughs> and, and for a couple of years now, I've just taken it to be synonymous with truth makers. And since that's what we're trying to figure out now, I'm not going to be able to appeal to states of affairs to understand truth makers. Oh uh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, but what makes that true, Kenny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the state of your affairs i mean oh, maybe the podcast uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, and actually I, I recently read something i maybe it was with you i don't remember that made me think that state of affairs might just be a clumsy translation mm -hmm. from german so maybe maybe it sounds better in german oh yes that's possible um yeah, I don't remember where this came up. Did it? Yeah. Yeah, it was. I'm sure it was in the but, uh, the the you know uh, with our reliable voice. German translator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah we're doing. Yeah, we're doing actually, this, I mean, that, uh, that might be. We're right. doing this convo thing. We're doing this uh, close reading um, on Clubhouse, and a guy who always joins us uh, is not uh, as much of a philosopher as he is our. German translator. So whenever we get stuck, he says, well, let me pull out my etymological dictionary for this particular word. <laughs> means this and that. <laughs> and he's and he is German. He was and he's in Germany. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's calling in from Germany. <laughs> Didn't this come up in the last paper? Uh, they kind of it might have, actually. You can find, right? And they're saying states of affairs translated something like uh, the, the structure of the metaphysical structure of the world, something like that. <laughs> something like that. Right. Yeah. The last paper. So whatever you mean by states of affair, it seems quite different from what you know, like Wittgenstein meant or maybe oh, the German. Oh, yeah. yeah. And there was that Ver, Verhalten versus yeah. Sachverhalten or something, which is like exactly. thing behavior. Sachverhalt. Sachverhalt right. or like the behavior of the thing or the thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. right. Yeah, you're right. And so in my, in, in, in my translation of the Tractatus, it's, it's just states of affairs. There. And when I put in that Sachverhalt, whatever word in Google <laughs> Translate, um, it comes out as facts, and then another translation came in states of affairs. So, like, there's definitely I, some details lost. Well, there you go. I mean, we got from the previous paper on uh, truth makers that yeah. the reason truth maker is introduced as a phrase by the three authors was to go neutral on what otherwise would be fact, states of affairs. Um, what else? What would right. Be well, well, what I find fascinating. And I think the two, the two German, I mean, it's a German, I think called portmanteau words. I can't remember where the Germans put things together, but it's like the combination of the words for thing and the words for circumstance or behavior. Right. Mm. So it's like, think... yeah, so states, states of affairs, you can see why they would, mm. um, but, but maybe states of affairs that sort of loses that sense of the object. It's know, actually, it's it's a, it like actually, an object actually... in a situation kind of. It actually stays closer in French because affairs in French means stuff. So the state of your stuff sounds much better. Yeah. <laughs> it's, close, it's closer. It's closer to reality and fact. And I love. I love the Rosellian one though. Verifier. Yes. Very unfortunate. Verifier. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, oh, and did you, you notice know, the comment where he says that? He... that uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Did you notice that comment where uh, he said that uh, Russell's later work was 
neglected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's amazing. I, I, I did notice that, and actually, I've always thought that because almost everything that I ever read of, uh, or almost every reference I ever see to Russell, you know, is uh, you know, is basically before World War One, or maybe shortly or during or shortly after. Hmm. <laughs> but he did actually write a philosophy at least through the forties. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, it's, it is, it's very fascinating. When you, History when is you strange. Start writing all the self-help books. Is that later? After, after well, he, he, he wrote a, f a few here and there. Yeah. But mostly after. Oh, World he wrote War a bunch. Think. He wrote a ton of like popular. Oh, he's he, he, he's actually, he's help, actually like, prolific. I mean, he probably, he probably, he probably wrote over a hundred books. <laughs> yeah. No, I think it was like 80 or something, something. Yeah. It's a lot. Wow. Yeah. I, mean, what, I, don't, what I don't know. One of my favorite books from my 20s was, uh, what, what's the one on happiness? The Conquest of Happiness? Is that the one? Yes, I, it's a good one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it was like the my, perfect like yeah. uh, prototype uh, for the self-help genre. It's amazing. Well, absolutely, yeah. My, my favorite one yeah. was In Praise of Vitalness. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good, yeah. 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 He actually wrote a novel. What? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Huh. Google it now. H. Yeah, Lawrence wrote sure. a novel. In which one of the characters yeah, wow. is modeled on Russell? And oh, that's him. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! What a, what a, what a time! I'm pretty sure. Okay, we're blowing through our time budget because we all got to go to sleep at <laughs> one hour and twenty minutes. An hour and twenty minutes. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. What point are we on? Prop, uh, top of one twenty-three. Um, Propositions are abstractions, but not in an otherworldly sense. Yeah. Oh, right. I didn't highlight anything else on this page. It was all fascinating, but basically he's just saying, yeah, I hear it great, some great, great problems. Uh, I'm aware of them, but I'm trying to avoid dealing with that right now. The main thing yeah. is just to think about whatever follows the word that. Right. And, and what also makes beliefs different from each other right yes right because you might think beliefs are all in the head but what makes one belief different from the other and it's going to be the content of the belief that's what he's talking about it, yeah and he also says and it is also going to account for impossible stuff like uh from matt's right you know that like uh that there is a counter instance or a counter example i've never heard the word counter instance to from matt's last theorem or how's it believed that the circle could be squared you know right and, th and that might be one way in which you distance uh, intentional objects from states of affairs, right? Because you, you can't have impossible situations as intentional objects. Um, no, I think you can still do it. So, it just can't be an identity. It's got to be the many to many thing with some an, another layer of indirection. But for the simple okay. cases, it might turn out to be identity. Um, so the very last line or last two lines in this section I thought was really interesting so truth makers for truth uh, sorry truth makers for truths necessitate absolutely necessitate those truths or so I have argued it seems clear however that truth makers cannot necessitate actual beliefs thoughts and statements the propositions taken as possible intentional objects are the only things that truth makers can actually necessitate so I, I remember in like psychosemantics the issue was if causation determines the content of concepts how do you, how are you wrong about anything, right? Mm -hmm. And so it is interesting here that if it's an identity claim, it can't be between a brain state or a belief and the truth maker. It has to be between the proposition and the truth maker. And then right. the proposition is instantiated with the, the mental state. And so that might be an argument for it not being an identity between part of the part of the world, but between part of the world and an abstraction. And then that property or abstract entity is instantiated or realized in you know the physical um so right. it might it might necessarily not be reducible to an, an identity claim but that properties or sorry that um propositions must be properties or abstract entities or something yeah no i i when i i'm speaking very loosely i i don't think it's an identity relation i just think that there's an identity relation in there somewhere yeah no i I feel to that your point, point, actually, I also highlighted we we may call such truths unexpressed truths, generalizing to include falsehoods. We can speak of well, that's unimportant. But yeah, so he basically says uh, it's got uh, 
it can't be bound by what people have actually thought. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's there's a lot here in this possible intentional object, right? So now I I, I have to know what he you know how he um, how he deals with possibility in general. Like, what what is that? If it's not going to be no, um, no no no, that's the, well, it depends. I mean, do you mean do you mean in general how he deals with possibility, or do you mean uh, uh, modality for truth makers, or I mean uh, truth makers for modality? Well, I assume they're going to be the, the same account, no? No, I mean, no. How... Well, I mean, the truth makers for modality will depend on his account for modality, but I was asking whether you're interested for, to this point in his account of modality for all purposes well, I, I'm or interested, for the purpose. Yeah. Well, generally, I'm interested in modality, yes, but it doesn't sound like he's going to adopt a Lewisian account of, of you know, possible worlds to cast no, out. No, he famously has his own, right? It, that's right, that's right. So that's something yeah. I, I want to get into for this, but just in general as well, because I've never Well, we been... did read that paper, so maybe uh, yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. <clears throat> yeah so okay so section seven or more let's let's pick it up section eight section seven i mean i think we're are we kind of get through we got through that yeah Did oh that's connecting truth with reality sorry okay so basically correspondence for the win yeah yeah that's basically it <laughs> yeah Oh, with the opponent, oh, no, no, no. Uh, the one-to-one -one case is ruled out, right? In not section. ruled out, but but not not ruled to be general. So there may be cases of one-to-one, -one, but but what he's arguing for is a theory that's many-to-many. -many. Um, very often many-to-many. -many. He says regularly many-to-many. -many. And that one bit of uh, supportive evidence for this is that the same thing happens with properties and that everybody accepts that. Uh... Oh, the, the same thing yeah. happens in the relationship between properties and predicates, which I thought was kind of an interesting right. point. Yeah, I mean, I take I take properties. Uh, I mean, I take predicates to correspond to truths, and properties to correspond to truth makers. Right. Just as names and objects correspond in similar ways, and so if you're going to have many to many between predicates and properties and names and objects, well. <laughs> You know, you should expect the same for truths and truth makers. Yeah. Very, very compelling. Okay. Right. Though so there is this interesting idea Sorry. of <laughs> the sparse properties. Oh, yes. Right. So there might be, um, which he gets the term from David Lewis. Uh, he says, the ones which he and I hold to be on the ontologically significant properties of objects, those in terms of which the world's work is done, which is kind of interesting. So what he means you know, by so that, I might... looked it up, is the ones that are uh, that uh, uh, that that figure in the causal relations, the fundamental causal relations. Right, like the yeah, um, right, yeah. So there might be a many-to-many -many link between, say, the property, the predicate of being red, and the various properties in the world that are crimson, scarlet, whatever. Um, Hmm. Those are but all those would be sparse. have this relation to being red, but oh, they're sorry, not sparse. Abundant. They're yeah, they're they're, sparse. they're they're whatever the opposite of sparse abundant. is. Abundant, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rotund. I don't know. Uh yeah. But then, so then it would be something like, you know, no, I no, guess no, it would no. be the, something Lewis like, is rotund, but he says abundant. Oh, okay. He says abundant property. Okay. Uh, but he is and rotund. then they yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the the oh. property like uh having a certain charge or something. I don't know, whatever might be a property where you do yeah, exactly. them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Well, one that might not be sparse would be something like uh, Jade, right? Exactly. Yeah, Jade I mean, would the, be... the way Lewis puts yeah. it is uh, that the sparse ones are the ones uh, at which uh, nature's joints are carved. Right. It's the metaphysically real properties. He just doesn't want to say it that way because of his human supervenience. Yeah, right. Is it that, or does it does it map well, any to the distinction last week between dependent and independent properties? Yeah, dependent ones aren't not real. What did we read last week? The the Barry Smith. The, blah, 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 I don't know. Three. <laughs> Mulligan. Oh, you mean, oh, you mean for the I mean for the truth makers. Uh, dependent. Yeah. Wait, what dependent. was the dependent? Uh, oh, you mean right uh, the, the um how moments are dependent on oh, objects yeah. or something? Is that? Right, right. Or objects that that existence is dependent on other objects. That's right. Yeah. 
Yeah. But they're still real. Remember that very well. They're still real. Yeah. Which ones would be sparse on, on Lewis's account? The sparse That's ones are question. the, the sparse ones are the, No, they're both real. It's it's the sparse ones are just the 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 um the the, the ones that nature's joints. I mean just think of it as there being fewer of them. That doesn't get me far. The, the maybe sure, because, the yeah, because because uh, because most of the properties you can think of are not the concern of physicists, but mass is. Right. So just just fundamental properties like charge or spin or something. Yeah, like pretty much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Prop prop properties play that uh, play a role in laws. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Specifically so in relation to causation. Yeah. Okay. I yeah, guess like I guess that might be redundant if you take all the laws to be causal laws, which they may well. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay, but then we get a definition of truth, which isn't really a definition. Not a definition. But he does <laughs> title the section a realist definition. Well, actually, he does add a question mark. Uh, question mark. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, the answer is, right, yeah. no, not really, but you know, whatever. <laughs> well, yeah, it's not that it's a theory rather than definition because it's circular, perhaps. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that was, that was kind of <laughs> I thought that was yeah. kind of funny. I mean, it, it, it is defining it. It's just a theory that makes it okay. It's, it is defining, it's just not a substitutional definition. It's, a, it's, an implicit, it's a partial implicit definition, which means that it further defines, but not completely. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, it, it depends on, I, it depends on whether or not, uh, <sighs> it depends on whether or not you think that it's circular, uh, whether or not you think the predicate uh, true virtue of is in some sense anal analyzable or something like that right and no so no i get that true get that. and something else because it, it might not be circular is what i'm saying <laughs> oh i see well he's certainly not uh, hoping it not to be i mean I, I take this just to be again constraining but not the end of the story and uh although i don't think he's taking truth to be prime he is admitting that for these very, very basic concepts, he says it is likely to be entwined with other fundamental notions. So he's not committed either way, which I think is appropriate. But as for the definition, it might be worth reading. <laughs> uh, so P, a proposition is true if and only if there exists uh, a truth maker T, some entity in the world, uh, such that T necessitates that P, and P is true in virtue of T. Or as he said elsewhere, um, P is made true by T. Right, which, which made me think that if, if truth is unanalyzable and we have this special necessitation relationship, if, if a complete metaphysics would actually cash out truth as something like necessity, like that's well, just it is it is no 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 it is analyzable and precisely just as you said in terms of necessity uh these necessitation well, relations right but that, that might just be a, a, a synonymous relationship right like we're just saying it just is necessity i'm not sure that's a definition though is it um you know it all comes down to what's most basic if you take something like necessity to be more basic than truth i think you might be able to do it uh, but if you take necessity to be defined in terms of truth, yeah, forget about it. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, he wants them all to be natural in some sense, so. In some sense. Yeah. I have yet to know what Armstrong means by natural because he helps himself to a great deal of metaphysics. That's not a criticism. Right. It's actually an, an optimistic note because I think he might have something I could use. If I had to, if I had to guess, I mean, one aspect of it, I think, is that uh, I think that he believes or takes himself to be a physicalist of some sort, and I, I think he thinks everything is concrete. But he just has some very complicated theory as to how exactly all of this metaphysical stuff can be understood. In terms yeah, I of, think that's. I think that's right too. And I think what's, yeah. what's very attractive about that is that he doesn't have to deny abstraction 
because if he just takes yeah. abstraction in a in a sense different from that suggested by Quine and Lewis, then those abstractions are themselves concrete or derivative of more primitively concrete reality, which is very attractive. Yeah, uh, for for all kinds of reasons. So, the thing I said earlier about containment was actually in section nine. I'm seeing the highlight now. Um, I want to read from the second paragraph on 127. The nesting of truth makers for a particular truth may cast some light on the old idea that in a valid argument, the conclusion is in some way contained in the totality of the premises. This is hard to make precise for the propositions that are linked as premises and conclusions in an argument, but if we consider truth makers for these propositions, perhaps something more interesting emerges. I like that a lot. I can't say that I saw it all the way through, but for the one inference uh, that he talks about, it does make sense. So, uh, well, is it something? Is this where the myriological something comes up? In this yeah. So, so, so something's yeah. being scarlet entails it's being red, because yeah. the truth maker. Uh, of the universal for scarlet is contained in the truth maker for the universal of red. Yeah. Mirrorologically. What if all yeah. logical inference were like that? That would be, that'd be amazing. Then you have a naturalization of logical inference. Well, that was what uh, Quine and Goodman tried. That was what Quine and Goodman tried to do, right? Uh, yeah, but I don't know if or was it, was it took it a mirrorological Yeah, I think approach. it was them. I think Did it was, a um, or approach? maybe Polish people. I think, I, I feel like it was one of, I feel like it was their paper, but I mean, it could be confusing them with some of the Polish logicians. There were, there were logicians in like, you know, in the early days who did try to do this. Hmm. It gives another example. Consider, for instance, the traditional syllogism, all men are mortal, Socrates is man, so Socrates is mortal. The truth maker for the first premise is, I think, the mirological sum of all the earthly lives of all men together with the totality state of affairs, that this is the totality of such lives. Since all of them in fact end with a death, we have here already a non-minimal truth maker for the death of Socrates. This truth maker contains as a proper part, the terminating of Socrates's life by death. <laughs> right. I, love I, it I wondered if this was like a... are so obsessed with killing people. It's just, it's just great. Yeah. <laughs> clang, clang, we're, clang. We're making up for our idleness. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was wondering if this was sort of the same strategy you would take for later. Um, but also I was wondering when he says um, um, all, you know, earthly lives, is this like a set of people? Is it a plurality? Is it just the myriological sum, all of it? And, and what, it's the mirrorological sum of them. Yeah, so I get understand right, which is which which is he equates with just a simple plurality, right? It's well, which is plurality, right? No, yeah, no, because the sum is a unity. Well, um, it becomes a mir any any so so any plurality of things. So um, the North Pole, um, right? My elbow and the number thirty-seven. Is a mirrorological hole on this count? Yeah, I, right. No, I, I, the mirrorological sum of the of of that plurality is um, a whole, but pluralities are not holes because pluralities are plural, not singular, and holes are singular. Well, he says the thesis that any plurality of things, however heterogeneous, is a mirrorological whole. Um. I think it's just some of them, but yeah, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, the, I mean, he, maybe he's being reductionist here, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't. There's some. Yeah, I, may, I, I, I'm, I don't I'm, know, I'm not defend, familiar with this literature, but yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to defend those who make a, a fuss over pluralities, but the truth is, I don't really care. I'm more interested in mirrorological sums, and uh, sets and individuals, and don't care much for plurality talk, and it doesn't come up in the paper, so I'm, you know, I'll just let it go. Well, we, we read something on plurality a while back, and they mentioned that mirrorological sums are taken as wholes. So you, you take it as a singular whole, even though it has parts, right? So that, yes, that's, but, that's the plurality. No. So the mirrorological sum would be the plurality, and it's taken no. as a singular whole, no? 
No. Uh, um, murology is not about pluralities. Pluralities are about alternative forms of quantifying. So instead of quantifying one thing at a time, you quantify many things at a time. Yeah. But mirological sums are more like the relations of fusions and parts and fissions and things like that. Okay, well, that's not how he's using the terms because um, he does just say his unrestricted mirological composition theory is the theory uh, is thesis is the thesis that any plurality of things, however heterogeneous, is a mirological whole. And then he says, um, mirology may not be all that's needed. Um, you might have to have things like facts, which are states of affairs that have um, have non mirological forms of co composition. A and F um, may both exist, and yet A not be F. I see. Right. So, yeah. So that that's where you get a distinction between just putting things together, and I mean, just listing things off and saying, "Well, there you got. You've got a whole, a mirological whole." So that's how he's using the terms here. Uh, it, I, don't, I don't think it's a difference in how to use words as much as uh, the fact that he's taking on another doctrine, namely, as he puts it, the doctrine yeah. of unrestricted mirological composition. Um, right. 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 So I, you know. We all mean the same things by the words, we just are assuming more or less than each other. But I'm happy to accept his assumption. I probably would agree with it anyway. This is becoming a pet peeve of mine, actually, as Kenny well knows. Uh, finding distinctions of meaning when there in fact may just be difference of opinion or position, or doctrine. Um, but anyway, that's, that's, not, that's not at stake here. Uh, I, oh, I love the last paragraph in section nine. He says, where propositions are false, we cannot have containment of truth makers, but may still, of course, have valid arguments. Provided, however, that the false propositions involved are not impossibilities. We can go to possible worlds where the entailing proposition is true and assert that in general, at least, the propositions truth makers in these worlds contain the truth makers of anything it entails. So here's you know, a nod to what we can do when we get modality worked out. Yeah, sure. And how it'll still not work for impossibilities, <laughs> which, which makes sense. <laughs> right, but right, right. But then he'll have the question. But then he'll have the question of the false makers or something. So, yeah. Okay, minimal truth makers. Um, I just want to read out loud the last, the first few sentences. We have introduced the least discerning truth maker of them all, W, the world. <laughs> The world, this reminds me of Davidson, right? The great fact. Um, oh, he yeah. Like, he doesn't like truth makers, but he, he, but he admits that, you know, truths have to be made true by something. So he says, okay, well, maybe they're just all made truth by the same thing. The great fact. But he's not talking about the world. Uh, uh, Armstrong does say the great, the great fact is the world. It is also the most promiscuous truth maker for it makes every truth or every truth that has a truth maker true. More interesting and of quite special importance for metaphysics is the notion of a minimal truth maker. If T is a minimal truth maker for P, then you cannot subtract anything from T and the remainder still be a truth maker for P. Straightforward. Um, but then what can we say about them? Mm -hmm. I don't like the great fact. Oh yeah, no, I don't like it either. I'm just making fun of Davidson. Um, but but this isn't about Davidson. No, this I mean even this idea that the world. No, no, no. But I mean just just that the world is is this small uh, truth maker. I, oh, you don't like that either. I don't like that. No, I just mm. find it to be that. Well, I, I want to say not informative, but that's relevant. It, it's just that I can't. It just seems. That is going to be some aspect or some chunk of reality that makes some proposition true. Perhaps so. it's over informative. No, no, but remember, <laughs> remember the. No, but re remember the uh, the previous section, right? So if 
if if um uh wait right he says well, so but okay. if someone wishes to say that what i call a non-minimal maker proposition is really a portion of reality that has the real truth maker as a proper part uh then i have no metaphysical objection no, so no, he but, says but, that but remember that if p entails q and t is the truth maker for p then t is a truth maker for q but if p is not the same thing proposition is q it must be because um um well, no, this is where last week's okay. paper went into this, where truth makers can't be meaning makers, but I don't think that's what Armstrong has in mind here. No, no, I don't mean that or at all. I just mean that, that, that there's oh. got to be some sense in which um, the, one of them is not a minimal truth maker, unless the entailment doesn't bring on more of the world, because it's uh, logically equivalent. Yeah, so that's why we have entailment star. So if it's an entailment star, you're bringing in more of the yeah. world uh with the p to get at q so if 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 p is snow is white and grass is green that entails that snow is white but the truth maker for the first will be both the snow and the grass the truth maker for the latter will also be uh the snow and the grass but it won't be the minimal truth maker because you only need the snow right okay so by extension you can just add the snow the grass the sky the clouds and you get the world as a truth maker for everything. I actually like it because it reminds us that all the truths are made true by the same thing, namely the world, the totality of being. Right, I mean, in some senses it makes everything true, but it isn't the minimal, it's the maximal truth maker of everything. Everything um, contingent minimal, anyway. And, sure, yeah, everything, okay, that's true. Yeah, everything contingent, yeah. Um, I, mostly this is complaining to Lewis, uh, which is why it wasn't right. quite as engaging, I think, because we haven't seen <clears throat> Lewis's take. Right. Oh, yeah, I think it was the previous one, right? <sighs> so maybe we should skip. Um, well, in the interest of time as well. I mean, this is basically about, you know, Lewis's possible works and... <clears throat> or in relation to this truth-making topic. Um, Here's a couple of sentences that might uh, leave us with at least a thought to return to. Um, it will be, suppose one thinks of each of the, no, where, where should I start? Okay. Um, Lewis defines a proposition as the class of all the worlds for which the particular proposition is true. Suppose that one thinks of each of these worlds as the truth maker for that proposition in that world. Let the proposition be cats catch mice. It will be true in our actual world and many other worlds. This gives us the class of worlds that Lewis identifies with the proposition that cats catch mice. But it is clear that this bunch of worlds is not a minimal truth maker for the proposition, though it may be a truth maker. The mirological sum of episodes in our world involving the generality of cats catching mice, when given the opportunity, seems to be nearer to what is needed for a minimal truth maker. Yeah, yeah, I just... Lewis is, of course, not trying to find a truth maker for the truth of a proposition, such as the proposition cats catch mice. But I submit that in metaphysics, we should primarily be concerned with truth makers. And it is this, I think, that is responsible for the weird sound of Lewis's doctrine of propositions. <laughs> I think I think this is um, this is just too difficult mm. before we get into what he wants to do with modality. I think that's right, but, uh, at least in the detail. Uh, however, the first sentence of uh, the second paragraph in 10, so on the previous page, 128, um, is, he's essentially just saying um, some kind of logical principle for doing metaphysics. He says, it's interesting to look at certain metaphysical theories from the perspective of truth-making theories and to consider whether the account that they offer of certain entity is a good account, is a good candidate for a minimal truth-maker for the truth as they take it to be that these entities exist. So I think he's, I, th I feel here he's just espousing, 
you know, a methodological principle for doing metaphysics, like that he thinks, you know, uh, that any good metaphysical theory has to cut its teeth, uh, uh, you know, against this general uh, theory of truth making. Um, well, I, I say general, but in, but in particular, in that it's a Stockham's razor, like for, for, for metaphysics, not in terms of number, but in terms of like the tightness of fit of the truth making. You know, it's, it's, it should be said like that, uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly admire it, but let's remember yeah. why Lewis introduced possible worlds to begin with. It was because his methodological metaphysical principle was quantification, which gets addressed later, right? Quining, quining right. quantification. If Quine uh, got away from these problems by just, you know, raising, raising an eyebrow to modal truths, Lewis says, well, let's just deal with them, right? Let's deal with the modal truths. But then we find ourselves quantifying over possible worlds. So uh, I guess they're real. So really this becomes a contest of methodological principles for metaphysics. Should we say that what is real is what we quantify over amid our truths, among which there will be modal truths? Or should we say that what is real is whatever our truth makers are? Right. And how much of a yeah. difference really is there between these two principles? Like for, for simple cases, it will be the same. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Right. I mean, there's a sense in which when everything is functionally functioning orderly, you know, in an orderly and simple fashion, the difference, there may not, there may not be any real differences. But I guess the, the challenges come up whenever whenever we, you know, the contrasts come up whenever we deal with things like, uh, I don't know, abstractions or fictional entities or uh, impossibilities or false, you know, false statements that might need false makers or, you know, the, these are the things where these, where these different approaches might somehow come apart, mm -hmm. where one might count it as something as existent and the other not. Uh, I currently lean in favor of Armstrong, not so much yeah. because of what he has to say about modality. Uh, of course, we haven't read it, but you know, it's kind of intimated where he might go. Uh, and we did read the combinatorial or the combination theory. The reason I lean in favor, even though I'm heavily biased for Quine, as you, may, as you know, uh, the reason I lean toward Armstrong is because of what he says about subject uh, uh, predicates later. Uh, so mm -hmm. I'll bring that up again when we get there because it's uh, just a couple pages out. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're, I we're on to 11 it. now, right? And yeah. there's 15. So yeah. All right. Yeah, we should push forward. Okay. So truth, a truth may have minimal truth makers, many, min many minimal truth makers. So here's he, here he's making good on his uh, innovation that if we give up on the one-to-one -one constraint, we make some headway. In particular, right. The other the other guys we read last week needed wanted uniqueness. Is that right? I think so. Isn't that right? I think they wanted uniqueness. I don't remember why, but I feel like they argued. Well, I think they 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 tried to get they tried to get the minimal by know. going for yeah no I know they tried they tried to do that by going with manifolds, but I thought that was a that was cheap because manifolds looked too much mm. like sets and pluralities after all. Yeah. Um, but you know, not knowing where they got the terminology, I I kept it to myself. But I now I now yeah. reveal myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, be careful um, with that on the internet. <laughs> yeah, so many people are gonna care. I'm gonna be canceled <laughs> for talking about manifolds uh, with such an attitude. Okay. <laughs> uh, a truth Women have... folds. <laughs> you know, I know. You know, the reason I know no one will care is because this is. Um, two hours into it and nobody gets past yeah. 10. Uh, okay. <laughs> also, you can, you can reveal yourself, you can reveal yourself all you want. Also, there's no video record. So really it's someone else speaking for me. Uh, it's true, okay, it's true. <laughs> okay. Deep so, fake. <laughs> deep <laughs> fake. Oh my God. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> Okay. Have so, you heard these like uh, deep fakes of other people doing like reading speeches, yeah. like celebrities reading, you know? Oh my gosh. 
I'm no. Any, anyways, yeah. I assume everything is. But it's very. <laughs> I I assume the UFOs are deep fakes. Oh no, maybe they're superficial fakes. <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god okay um wait does this mean the pentagon is a deep fake program deep deep no. state fakes wait what are we <laughs> <laughs> no it's a fake state program no. <laughs> in the deep state <laughs> oh my gosh um, so so What's the, I mean, so you give up, what's the virtue of, of having the many minimal truth makers against? Or it's just that. Oh, that you can handle disjunctions and existential quantum. Yes, that's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because which are always uh, pesky. It's, it's kind of obvious. In, metaf right? in metaphysics. It's kind of obvious. Snow is white and grass is blue. Uh, is, is, is true because Snow is white and grass and? is green. Or, has, or, no, no, or. Yeah. The, the reason oh, that this junction yeah, is yeah. true is yeah. because snow is white or grass is green has uh, multiple minimal truth makers. It's the same thing. Yeah. All right, moving on. Uh, truths without minimal truth makers. This is the funny little infinity thing. I, I think we can. I, think we can I thought one this. thing that was interesting in that section 11 is that he, <laughs> yeah, I thought his claim that. Existence is omnitemporal. It was interesting. But I don't know. Yeah. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. I liked that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and I, I think, I mean, I guess, I guess that makes sense to because you want to explain the truth of statements about the past. But mm -hmm. I, I wrote at the end, so a dodo exists? Question mark. Um, right. Oh. So I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, I guess they they existed. The, existed. The truth, but maybe that's... they're. They, maybe yeah, maybe it has to be existed. But right. Um, but aren't propositions always indexed to time and place? So it would be only true, if you're right? Heidegger. Only if you're Heidegger. Oh, right. Yeah, but if you're other right. philosophers, I mean, says, time is not something you have to talk about all the time. Now, always. But but as he as <laughs> as he sets it out, he doesn't doesn't do the index thing, right? He says so. Uh, consider the truth that a human being exists. There exists an X such that X is a human being. If we take existence omnitemporally, my own metaphysical preference and one that'll be later defended. Um, every human being that has ever existed now or will exist in the future is a truth maker for this truth, right? The truth that a human being exists. So if I say that consider the truth, right. a dodo exists, do I have to look at all dodos that ever existed? Because that will, one of them will make it true. But it seems to me that dodos don't exist. That's the sad, sad story of their extinction. So yeah. Well, but, but so yeah, just as he set it out he did not index it so i thought that was interesting well, but then what makes it true that the dodo is extinct on this account that that they yeah. that they don't ex that no they, they still exist right they're yeah but that they yeah, died if they're that, they died. that that they went extinct but going extinct does not mean not existing it just means that you have a, oh it, it, that's yeah. what you have to say going extinct doesn't mean you don't exist that's what you have right. to say right 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 all right Okay. You just have to yeah, read existence uh, tenselessly. That's all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He sort of. Just, yeah. He needs to. Everything yeah, exists. That doesn't. That doesn't mean they aren't created or destroyed. Oh, that yes. makes me feel better. So when I die, <laughs> I I'll, I'll still exist. So that still me. exists. Yes. <laughs> as yeah. as yeah. Roger oh, Scruton, result. As result. Roger Scruton put it, just yeah. a few years before he died, he says, um, in defense of uh, an eternal life, because he was trying to defend being Christian, even though he's kind of a. I don't know, very, very atheistic Christian. Uh, so the, the, the question, the, the interviewer said, yes, but but do you really think you survive in some sense after he says, well, there is a sense in which your 75 years on earth are eternally yours. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> right. Hmm. And, then, and then you have, you know, and they have people like like Ayn Rand, right? Who who when she was interviewed and asked about like you know, are are you you know are you afraid of are you afraid of death? And she, and she said, Oh no, I'm I, I I'm not afraid. I'm not going to die. And the interviewer was like, Excuse me. And she says, It won't be me that dies. The world will die. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That was nice. like, wow, that's the great virtue of selfishness. There ever was. <laughs> it was like, you know, that's that's some serious solipsism there. Wow. Yeah. Quite 
quite powerful. <laughs> at least, at least she's consistent. <laughs> okay, we're definitely getting canceled <laughs> by all the Ayn Randians at YouTube. <laughs> That's right. Yes, all of the uh, all of the Bitcoiners that uh, watch our channel. But, but, yeah, but by by her arguments, they they don't they've died, right? <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> they've died. Yeah. Right. yeah, but they haven't gone extinct. That's the problem. Oh, okay. That's That's the problem. <laughs> Section twelve. So truth truths without minimal truth makers. Wait. Yeah, I want, yeah, I want to skip just... this one. I want to skip it, but you guys talk. <laughs> I just don't well, that, yeah, anybody. this sort of this already well, this already sort of came up a little bit in, yeah. in the the stuff about entailment, right? Or no, the stuff about maximizations, right? That um, uh, the necess the necessitation argument depended on there being a truth maker for every truth. So that's why this is. Oh no, truth without minimal truth makers. Maybe that's not the same thing. No, this that's is not. anything involving infinity, right? Is that oh, the, okay. the only the only case, I think? Yeah, I know of no other set of cases except certain truths involving infinity, such as the example given. Um, uh, just let's just yeah. say it. The infinity of integers, sorry, that there is an infinity of integers is made true by the integers, but it's also made true by the odd integers, which is less than the integers. Uh, but it's also made true by the multiples of four, which is less than the multiples of two. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't have, I, I would have skipped this section. Uh, maybe for completeness, he wanted to put it in. Okay. So you, well, need uh, actually, it's funny. I was thinking, like, you know, it's that there's a question as to what makes it minimal here because the cardinality is always the same. So, mm. actually, but, that's a good point. <laughs> but yeah, numerically, so, it's, it's a funny but, sort of unintuitive uh, cardinality. Well, we were, right. we logically, but myriologically is different. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. No, but he, no, yeah, no, so. he did define he did define minimal, not in terms of cardinality, but in terms of there not being some proper part. There not being some proper part. Yeah, that's okay. Right. Okay, so unique minimal truth makers. He says, um, there are cases where truths have one and no more than one minimal truth maker. And I think. I don't know if he emphasizes this as much as I would have. I think these are very special and very important. As I said earlier, they might constitute a supervenient space of some kind. I think it's very important because this is where the word trope comes in. Well, actually, that's not a coincidence, you know, uh, because if you have a trope metaphysics, then it would pretty much be the same thing I just said. Uh, I don't know if I can back that up, but it's a feeling. And he says, it's, it seems clear then that many truths have minimal, have many minimal truth makers, um, but there are cases where truths have one and no more than one minimal truth maker. For instance, if there are states of affairs, such entities as A's being F, with A a particular and F a genuine universal, or for that matter, F a genuine trope. The truth A is F has that state of affairs as a unique minimal truth maker. You'll notice these are the atomic sentences where both the predicate right. and the name, uh, or rather where the subject and the predicate are both names as both yeah. variables. So there's something, uh, it has a product place. Uh, and then he says, yeah, but there's not much you can say about this without basically saying everything about metaphysics and I'm not going to do that right now. <laughs> but then he says, but it's better than what Quine does. And then he says, let's talk about Quine. Section 14, quantifying over. <laughs> Quintifying over. Um, Quintifying? <laughs> Quintifying. The quantifiers. I love how, how often people's names just happen to, I don't know. Like, for example, oh Armstrong, he doesn't strong arm us, you know, he goes gentle and um. quantifies. Okay. There are some other obvious ones like uh, Ned Block being a blockhead about qualia. And... <laughs> 
isn't there even like some sort of blockhead universe argument yeah. or something? There's there's a blockhead example. Uh, oh, it's, okay. it's, it's 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 a it's a counterexample to functionalism, where if you have a uh, okay. robot, if you have a robot that follows instructions, it's very similar to the Chinese room. Uh, then does it have quality? Up? Well, they call the robot blockhead. Oh, that's funny. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, so the uh, quine stuff, yeah, the predicates. That's right. So, I, I highlighted this whole thing. I think it's worth reviewing. Or, sure. Know. Okay. To postulate um, certain truth makers for certain truths is to admit those truth makers into one's ontology. That's the meta methodological principle, right? That you were talking about. The complete range of truth makers admitted cons admitted constitutes a metaphysics, which alerts us to the important point stressed already, but bearing much repetition. The, that the hunt for truth makers is as controversial and difficult as the enterprise of metaphysics. I think that proceeding by looking for truth makers is an illuminating and useful regimentation of the metaphysical enterprise, or at least the enterprise of a realist metaphysics. But it is no easy and automatic road to the truth in such matters. Oh, actually, you know, this is an interesting point in that the methodological principle that he's proposing isn't as broadly applicable as Quine's uh, because it's really for the realist, whereas Quine's is for anybody. Mm. Or maybe Quine's is only good for the extensionalist. Uh, but yeah, anyway. Oh, well, this I raises, suppose that might be true, yeah. But this raises the question of Quine and the signaling of ontological commitments by what we are prepared to, to quote, quantify over, unquote. Why should we desert Quine's procedure for some other method? The great advantages I see it of the search for truth makers is that it focuses us, us, us not merely on the metaphysical implications of the subject terms of propositions, but also on their predicates. Aquinas told us that the predicate gives us an ideology rather than an ontology. So now, you're right. I mean, that's the mind is only going to have first order quantifiers. Yeah. And not only that, he's using the word ideology here in two ways. One, as in ideas as opposed to the things, right? Uh, as in the forms, the platonic forms, but also to, I think, associate it with the negative connotation of ideology because he's negative on this kind of ontology, the ontology of properties. Yeah, right. right? I mean, Quine, in other words, Quine is sort of saying it's kind of like an ideology. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a joke because it isn't really, but, but it's bad. Yeah. They're both bad. Right. right. Then he says, right. uh, then uh, Armstrong says, the saying is rather dark, but it is clear that to some degree he has stacked the ontological deck against the predicates as opposed to subject terms. He has stacked it because he seems to define ontology as against ideology, whereas it might encompass both. But when we look to truth makers for truths, subject and predicate starts, start as equals, and we can consider the ontological implications of both in an unbiased way. You know, to me, even though I've been reading about quantifying over as a way to... Um, measure your ontology forever in one paragraph mm -hmm. i lost it in <laughs> one paragraph i'm with armstrong i mean it's just so clear i think i was already headed in this direction but never really made the jump mm. but yeah I, I can't go back now so i don't know if that has implications for how i go about doing metaphysics but but since i was always of a realist and rationalist bias i may as well Yeah, I mean, after all, if you have the realist bias, then presumably, um, well, you you might want to say uh, that the only things uh, that exist um, are, uh, you know, not not per se the things that are quantified over, but that that, that play a role in true true statements or are referred to by uh, by true statements. Right, because everything presumably that, it's everything else is part of a false ontology. Right? Yeah, it's not. Right? It's not. It's not what the truths quantify over. It's what the truths supervene on. Yeah, the being. Right. Yeah. Exactly. The being. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. 
and uh, the rest I think is just uh, addressing concerns that might raise. Were there those concerns any of you had? Um, well, you brought us to the last paragraph of this at the oh, beginning yes. of the discussion, right? But I think that is where he's, but even if um, we go to an account that focuses on things, not facts, right? Because, uh, you know, his, his approach requires taking uh, uh, or suggests taking properties and relations as being part of our ontology. And, um, but if we, if we want to just restrict ourselves to a world of things um, and, and not take facts or something is also, then, then we can still um, uh, have a doctrine of truth makers for those as well. Right. Because um, we'll have these fundamental truth makers of X exists. For, for the proposition X exists and that will be the thing. The X's, whatever they are. Well, I mean, I, I think I think the, the things are just gonna, the things and the facts will coincide provided that properties and universals are, if not particulars, then grounded on particulars. Grounded by, how do you say this? Grounded on or grounded by? Basically have, have particulars as their ground. Yeah. I don't know if it's on or in, but yeah. By, uh, yeah, I'm not sure. But you know what I'm saying? It's, it comes yeah. down to what you think abstraction is. So then, the, you again, know, do you mean the abstraction of the properties? Uh, well, if you actually know what, that might not be right. What I mean is, okay, speaking more broadly, let me just uh, adopt Armstrong's strategic uh, reserve. It comes down to how we make sense of the relation between universals and particulars, uh, yeah. so as to not amplify our, our ontological ground given by the particulars. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there are, there are at least two different ways of doing this and I think uh, Armstrong might, Armstrong's might be a third, but one way is the human supervenience way, which is all you have are the particulars and everything else you might say right. supervenes on them. Another is a very rationalist view. I, I don't know who this is best represented by among our readings, but I do vaguely remember reading somebody about laws and positing, or not positing, but given the hypothetical of two distinct worlds in which all the particulars across time behave in exactly the same way, but the laws are different. Do you remember that article? Um, it wasn't, I think it wasn't somebody advocating for it, but it was, uh, but they were relaying a, 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 you know, a, a common uh, counter argument or whatever. I think that was the very, isn't it very low? Uh, no, that was that was another human supervenience one, right? I thought it was somebody who did. Yeah, but I feel like that example came. Out. You think it was but the example, example, I think, I think the example in in his, but it's not. It's not. Um, it's not that he believes it. It's that, but it, but it's he was giving the other side. I, I think. See. I don't remember. Um, okay. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but. Um, no, you're right, actually. I'm looking at it right now. It, yeah, you're right. It is in his... Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just by chance, I just, you know, whatever. Uh, so... <clears throat> uh, Armstrong um, said he has a rationalist presence. But I know that there are people who... But I know there are people... Or something. Yeah. Uh, there are people yeah. um, like to Tim Maudlin, it. you know, holds views like that. Um, right. Well, Maudlin is referenced by Barry uh, Lauer in that paper. Yes. Yeah. 
I think I remember that actually. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that's the second. Yeah. Thing. And I think Armstrong might sure. be a third between the two. Uh, I believe that's right. That's my sense. That's the sense I have of Armstrong. Right. Is and that... if that's the case, then the the things aren't going to be enough. Yeah. Because right. Because the properties so, are going to be there. Somehow. Right. So I could go either yeah. way on that. I really don't want to have an opinion until I settle on what to think about modality, which is about the 10th time we mentioned that we really want to know about modality according to Armstrong. <laughs> Even though we already read a paper about modality, at Brian, I just don't remember it. I, I remember thinking, oh, this is good, I guess. Never heard anything like it. I'm tired. Want to get dinner? Yeah, um, it was. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely his own view. But like the three, three of the, you know, the three sort of like umbrella views are like Lewis, uh, Armstrong and uh, Plantinga, which we did also read at some point. Plantinga? I thought Stonlicker was number three. Um, no, well, Stonecker is a sort of under the umbrella of the of Plantinga, the, the, the system Plantinga sort of laid out. Yeah. I oh, think. okay, okay. Um, All right. So, section fifteen. Should we finish it? Yeah. Uh, different truths, same minimal truth makers. Oh, this was fantastic. So this is like an application of everything he's done so far. Um, so it also shows that truth makers don't determine meaning, right? Mm, yes, that's right. This is a very important point. Uh, so it's not just an application. OK. So truths may have minimal truth makers. Is it the case that different truths can have the very same minimal truth maker? He says, I'll construct an artificial, oh, this is a reference to uh, one of Karen's favorite examples. And we'll construct an artificial example because my point can be made more clearly. But I think that there may be empirical examples, such as the philosophically famous case of the chicken sexers. But he doesn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> the chicken sexers, of course. The example he gives is instead about uh, somebody who can recognize pentagons but doesn't really know anything about pentagons. It's just a gestalt skill. And then one day he learns geometry and um, what happens then? Where is that line where he says he then learns geometry? Well, I think, is it the truth that he grasps is surely a different truth? Is that kind of the... Yeah, of course. Uh, Oh, here it is. It seems to be a necessary truth that the property picked up by this person is the regular pentagon shape. If we imagine that he later learns geometry, then he will rediscover this necessary truth a priori. Okay, now I hope you know, I hope you know what I'm going to say next. But what other example do you know that contrasts the state of mind in relation to truths? after an episode of learning. Yeah, well, it's the, the Mary thing. I mean, all of these <laughs> exactly. reflexes, yeah. <laughs> right. or, uh, yeah. One of the absolutely. standard answers to the, the, to the Mary yeah. argument, which by the way is my favorite one, although I haven't explored it, I don't really know how to make sense of it. But my favorite answer is that Mary learns something because she gets new knowledge without new facts. So the new knowledge that she gets is made true, that is the truth that she knows already made some other knowledge that she already had. Mm. But then is qualia propositional? Well, uh, qualia itself is not a proposition, but, but what she learns is a proposition uh, in terms of qualia, yeah. Oh, in terms of what's that really? Well, it's 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 just one of the, it's 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 um it's what you well, learns it's the, about. It's the it's like the gestalt. <laughs> it's the gestalt. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's. I mean, it, it is never really gestalt, thought about, but it is the... like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. No, no, no. It's interesting. I've never thought about that as an uh, analogy for the Mary thing. That's really fascinating. Uh yes. I mean, that's it's like you know some. It's the same proposition that she comes to recognize in a new way. 
right a new way or the same the same truth mm. or the same fact rather no 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 right it's so i might have said this no no no. it's not the same proposition because those Sorry. are the truth bearers right it's the same truth Sorry, maker, yes, the same fact the same, the same truth, truth maker yeah right the same truth maker yeah so the, the point is that the quality language. rests with the proposition not with what makes the proposition true right hmm I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it's almost, it's almost like, uh, it's almost like the same truth maker, but, but the, um, you know, I, I guess there's a hard question as to whether it's the same proposition, um, but, In any case, one might say that perhaps what the difference is is that there's a difference in sense or something like that. You know. Well, different mode of presentation, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. Exactly. Whatever that means. Yeah. Whatever that means. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Anyway, I thought with I, this yeah. with this point, the the earlier example of scarlet and red was much more intuitive. I mean, and he says there's more the the stuff about pentacons is a more controversial case, but where he says, look, uh, the proposition A's surface is scarlet and A's surface is red may both be true. Um, although the first truth necessitates the second truth, they are different truths. Yet the minimal truth maker for both truths may well be the same, the possession by the surface of the exact shade of color that it has. Right, so yes, A's but surface. What scarlet, but what does scarlet look like? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I think that's all to say, right? Right. Um, well, yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, and that's why the, the the truth maker, which is the surface, is independent, I guess, from the meaning of those. Uh, that does doesn't not quite work. Uniquely uh, pick out the meaning of those propositions. Yeah, that doesn't right, quite because, work if you want to use tropes, because then it would be different tropes, not the same truth maker. Sure. Uh, well, actually, no. So, well, it depends. Um, yeah, if you want to use tropes, I guess it wouldn't work. But like in the uh, in the paper we read uh, last week, they gave examples that are like this. Like when if you had, I don't remember what the name is. It was you know like Bob or something, is a man, but he's also an animal. Oh yeah. Um, but it's the mm -hmm. same. It's the same truth maker in both cases. And they were saying it's just the object. That right. um, but they were more willing to be pluralistic though about what the truth makers uh, could be. Um, this leaves me wondering very much right about but they also the role accepted played by it universals just... yeah mm -hmm. what's that karen well i think and they also i thought i thought they also made this this claim that the truth makers are not are different from the meaning oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah. Or do yes. not you know, uniquely determine the meaning, right? So, which is which is one reason why the there might be this disconnect between uh, propositions and intentional objects, whatever we end up saying those are, and mm. and, and the and the truth makers that they that make those propositions true. Mm -hmm. hmm. What did you think of the all ravens are black? And the contrapositive, all non-black things are non-ravens. Right. So presumably it's it's all the ra all the ravens, <laughs> omnitemporal raven <laughs> uh, plurality, right? That um, makes all ravens black. And it's also but it, but, sure. it, but the contrapositive is the non-black things. The, the act, you know, such as the green things and the black, oh, or right. the gray things and the white things and so on, and the colorless no, not, things, not, not things that are not, not ravens. ravens. Yeah, <laughs> exactly yeah. right. That are not well, ravens. So, that makes mm -hmm. that true. Yeah, it's interesting, right? So it's actually really interesting because they're logically equivalent, which is um, right. Armstrong even appeals but to thing, undergraduate intuitions. Well, uh, no, we'll say, of you. but our, Armstrong <laughs> Armstrong says it might be the case that they have the same minimal truth makers. Um, whereas you're suggesting maybe they have actually the opposite or what, 
Well, he says yeah, it's yeah, very plausible yeah. to say that they have the very same and uh, uh, the very right, same right, minimal and many. all other truth makers, but it is arguable at least that here we have different truths. <laughs> no beginner in logic will be inclined to criticize this thesis. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I think you, you were suggesting that they have a complementary truth makers but not the same, or that, what do you call it when they- Oh yeah, too late. I mean, right. That's that what I was suggesting, the, yes. Yeah, you were suggesting that they have different- Right, because it's like you have the, the ravens, which are black, and then, you know, the rest of the universe the <laughs> right it's the rest of the universe that somehow makes the contrapositive uh right true it's interesting yeah right um which is a different way to go than what he has here it's interesting i mean it's it's the same partition right it's like it's the same information <laughs> right just somehow focusing on the different <laughs> sides of it I wonder if some if this can be generalized, you know, if you say, you know, the tomato is red, is there a similar way of inverting to the complement, you know, going to the complements to get um, a different truth maker for the same, sorry, uh, another truth for the same truth maker? I'm, I think not, but I wonder why not. Like. Oh, another. Oh, is there is there any proposition for which uh, it and its contrapositive have the same truth maker? No, I think I think contrapositives will always have this feature. What I mean is, okay, when it, when it isn't a conditional, are there oh, okay. any other examples? Maybe without a quantifier, maybe without a conditional. Like sure. any other logical forms for which you get this kind of the thing, the truth maker and its complement. Um, sure. Yeah. Some sort of where there's some sort of equivalent. Um, and I guess the point here is that you can think of the, the 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 black ravens as the truth maker, but it's the black ravens, but also the non-ravened black things. Sorry, the non-ravened to not black things. Well, no, no, I think I think I think I think Armstrong's point is that it might be the ravens that are the truth maker for both, which goes to show that different truths can have the same truth maker. But what we're what we're suggesting is maybe they have different truth makers. Oh yeah, I guess I'm with case you. He, yeah, yeah, guess, yeah, in yeah, which case right. he would he would need a, he would need a different example to make that point. Again, I mean it's it's yet another example he's offering of something yeah. that because the the uh, all ravens are black is a different truth than non black things are non ravens. But right. he says it's possible that they have the same minimal truth maker, which is um, presumably all the omnitemporal ravens uh but he's not yeah. clear so maybe maybe that's not what he has in mind but anyway yeah i'm not sure i think this might raise questions about universal quantification uh and condition well let me think um hmm uh yeah I'm not, I, I'm not it's not obvious to me that the ravens are the truth maker even in all ravens are black i i'd have to think about it some more it depends i mean if you think if you if you take all ravens to be a referential uh term then sure but if instead you take that to be that for all things if it's a raven then it is black then i'm not sure what the truth maker is other than the whole world Yeah, I, I, so the only thing I can think of, you know, when stripping the quantifiers out is tricky to figure out what it would be. The only thing I can think of. Maybe uh, think of it as an infinite disjunction, right? Because you can convert the con material conditional into a disjunction. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I was, I, I was, I mean, in a, in a, in a, so an infinite disjunction, I was thinking about it just, if I was thinking of a second order propositional example or sentential example, but that's equivalent, I think, to what you're saying. 
Yeah, basically. I wonder. Everything. I wonder if that. So, so like, if you have red as a color, uh, well, no, just color take the is not color is not red. Yeah. Well, no, just just take ravens of black. So, right. As, as an infinite disjunction, you say first. You, first, you take first. You do a universal quantification of a disjunction, right? So you just say all everything is either uh, everything is either black or not a raven. Right. Right. Yeah. I think uh, you can do this, but I think it's going to fall, fall afoul of his desire that truth makers have relevance, whatever he thinks. Yeah. No. Totally. Is, right. Because oh. it's going to make the, it's going to make every, it's going to make the whole world the tr minimal truth maker for every statement about you know every general statement, which yeah. I think that's well, not maybe. Gonna, the, the, the clue is in the first two words of the paragraph. Logical equivalences provide other grounds. So yeah, because he wants to deal with logical truths in a way that preserves relevance, then what I'm thinking is going to run afoul, like you said. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right, yeah. But we don't know until he tells make... us what that treatment will be. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So much for the general theory of truth making. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it sounds like we're going to read the whole book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The whole Armstrong book? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are we going to so do sorry, that? Or sorry, are we gonna... sorry it's, wait, it's what you were saying, Karen. I'm sorry. I think it's just that, like, the, the logical, so the logical truth. Uh, well, I, I don't think all, like, ra I don't think that, all ravens are black is a logical truth, right? No, 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 the logical truth of their equivalence, right? That all ravens are black is equivalent to non-black things or non-ravens. Uh, that is a logical truth, or, you know. That, uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. That, that's that, fine. Is a log that is a logical truth. But then the question is, what's just, what is the relevant truth maker? Is it the ravens that are black or is it the non-black things that are non-ravens? Right. There and isn't a unique be... minimal truth maker for this equivalence, uh, but I don't know well, if that's supposed to, I don't know if that's a problem for him or not. I mean, I, it's just, well. I think I think he suggests there is probably... a, he suggests uh, there is a unique, a, a possibly a unique minimal truth maker for both because they're logically equivalent, um, but they're different truths. He thinks, um, but but so then the question is, what could that unique um, minimal truth maker be for both of these things and rodrigo yeah. saying well what well, one way it could be the same is if it's everything in the world why right? and, yeah yes but then do i think armstrong will say that and i'm saying i don't think so oh, okay it's, gonna okay. Make, it's yeah. going to mean that for every all claim yeah. the unique minimal truth maker it's everything in the world right 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 and remember yeah. when he talked about not wanting the unique, you know, the truth maker for two plus two equals four to be every truth that there is. <laughs> I mean, or every every state, every state. Of All the numbers. There is. All the numbers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> or 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 the pencil being on my head, right? Because you can do right. the entailment thing, right? And so he says, no, I want I want there to be some relevance between the 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 propositions and the and the um, you know, the and the uh, and the states of the world that make them true. So it, I don't think it's going to be everything that is. That makes the statement "all ravens are black" true. It's going to be the ravens. Yeah, interesting. Maybe, yeah. maybe every raven that ever existed, right? So, so I just don't think that. So, Rodrigo was sort of sketching one version of this um, uh, minimal truth maker mm. that can make something like "all ravens are black" true. But mm. I was just saying I don't think that Armstrong would go that route because it seems to violate the relevance. Um, requirement because see. it's going to make it's okay. going to make the whole the whole world the truth maker for any all claim any any universal generation like all men are mortal all whatever and he even talked about Socrates like the what made all men is mortal true was all the men right no, but it, it wasn't isn't. it wasn't the ravens but it isn't all the world it's it's either actually you know I think maybe this has two minimal truth makers. Uh, all the ravens omnitemporally uh, is one of the truth makers, uh, one of the minimal, minimal truth makers. And the other minimal truth maker is all the non-black things. But in neither case is it all the world. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's what I was thinking, but and he and he says that it's arguable, but he does. No, seem but this to be is independent. This is independent of the logical equivalence of those two sentences. So, so you're saying that? No, I know the, the truth does... maker for all. all no, no, no. In both cases, also includes. In both cases, they either is a minimal truth maker. Both all sentences. The black have... No, no, no. The non-black things. No, I don't think all the all the oh, all oh, the non-black things mm. is a minimal truth maker for all ravens are black. Yeah, it I is. I don't think because as long as none of them well, are ravens, no. it makes it true. But you can take you can take something away, and still all the ravens will be black. You can take away all of the um, red apples. Yeah, he, he may. Yeah, he may have a problem with them. Right, with these modal questions. I don't know. You can I also. I mean, I mean, no, I mean, no, I mean it, it works. It works. Yeah. It works with the ravens too. Like, suppose there are you know uh, there have only lived one hundred million ravens. Right. If you take yeah. away ten of them, it's still true that all ravens are black. So, what the minimal uh, truth maker is in either case is complicated by that point, and I don't know how to answer it. Maybe there is no minimal truth maker uh, in these. Um, let me think. No, actually, you I don't can't think we should over. I don't think we should if you over. Take away, if you take away those ravens, you're changing the world. The point is. If you don't change the world, but remove them from the truth maker, then you don't have it. Right. So if you remove the apples from the truth maker, still can you can you not still have all ravens no. being black? No. If you, if if you consider all the non-black things in the world, and none of them are ravens, then that that's what makes both of these sentences true. But now, if you take all the non-black things, no, you're talking about for... if you considering not making true. I'm not sure considering is has anything to do with what makes something true. No, no yeah, I'm just well, like you're talking to, about like ask, kind of like just, what you have to check. No, no, no. I'm just asking you to consider it. That's all. So uh, consider all the non-black things. That is a truth maker for either of these sentences. Now consider all the non-black things minus a few apples. Is that a truth maker? For these sentences, yeah, I don't sure. think so. I don't think so because sure it, it is. well, it's a partial truth maker, right? I, 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 I don't guess. think so. No, 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 no. It, it's a fully true. Ma All the ravens are going to be black, whether or not uh, a few apples are considered I'm, I'm, or, I'm not, not, or, or part, not saying, of it, yeah. well, part of the yeah. consideration or not. No, no. Hold, hold, I'm not asking whether the sentence is true. Of course, it's true. I'm asking whether that will be a truth maker. It would not be. Yeah, because it. Uh, the the idea is you the 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 um. The situation minus the apples still necessitates the truth of all ravens are black, so it's still a truth maker for all ravens are black. No, it, it, but the situation is the whole world. Of course, the whole world makes the sentence true, but the question is yeah. Whether, well, actually, that's part of well, actually, the whole the, the whole world without the apples makes the sentence true as well. As that's correct, but we're talking about minimal truth makers, and there are only two minimal truth makers, namely all the black, all the non-black things, and all the ravens. No, 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 no. Okay. I don't think all the non-black things is a minimal truth maker for um, all ravens are black. I just don't think it is. It may not be relevant. I guess the question is, is it a truth maker at all, right? That's the first question. Yeah. And then the second question is, is it minimal? So the I first it, question is where the relevance issue comes up. Yeah, I think this is a, first, matter of, it's yeah. a matter of relevance. But if you set the right. relevance question aside, yeah. it, is, it does meet. No, I understand. Issue. Right. Yeah. OK. So I think that is the sticking point, though. Well, I don't know what I don't know what Armstrong would say. About. No, I'm perfectly willing to accept that if you want your truth, make a truth yeah. maker theory to okay. say something to relevance in the case of yeah. mathematics. But in this case, each of these sentences will have one minimal truth maker and it won't be the same one. But if you set relevance aside, you'll have two minimal truth makers in both cases, and they'll be the same ones. Well, I think that's the dilemma for Armstrong, because he seems Absolutely. to want relevance, but he yeah. also seems to want these statements that are logically equivalent to have the same uh, truth maker. Yeah, so, maybe, he's in, maybe he's ambivalent. So he, 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 I, think, I think he's the one who has the problem here, because he wants yeah. to, yeah, he seems to want to hold these, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, he doesn't go into it, he just says it's arguable, and then he ends it. <laughs> right <laughs> so yeah. he's gotta he's gotta get home pick up the kids from soccer practice gotta turn the paper mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah we do too we have exactly per our new rule one minute and 
45 seconds left. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this was really good. Uh, do you, so you guys want to do, you guys want to jettison this, the book no, 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 no. with and go to Armstrong or? No, let, let's, let's get a few more perspectives before we dive into the book. I mean, who knows, but, um, but yeah, okay. let's, I mean, we just started. So, so I wouldn't be, uh, I'd be, happy I mean, if we just this book a seems to have a lot of good papers in it. So I don't, um, yeah. I mean, there, there are several that I was. Right. And anything else that grabs your attention. But anyway, I'll leave it there.